Okay, over to you, Chairman. We are now live. Thank you, Wendy. So, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to East Devon District Council's Virtual Strategic Planning Committee on the 20th of October 2020. I'm your Chairman, Dan Ledger. Uh, I would also like to welcome anyone watching this meeting via the live streaming. All participants here today are taking part remotely, and as well as being live streamed, the meeting is being recorded. So please bear this in mind throughout, and may I remind you to be careful with your language. May I also remind members that the Code of Conduct applies throughout the meeting. Um, we also reserve the right to remove and disconnect any participant who is disrupting the meeting by whatever means. As this strategic planning meeting is dependent on an internet connection and a power supply, in the event of a break in the internet connection or power cut, please bear with us as we try to reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we are not able to reconnect, uh, we will consider the meeting adjourned and reconvene at a later date. Please check the committee page on our website for details. Please make sure all phones are switched off or on silent. I'm gonna do that now to mine. Uh, and make sure all your microphones are muted when you are not speaking to avoid any background noise levels. Keep points short and please do not repeat uh, points. Uh, that you've already been made and do not interrupt. If you wish to make a comment, please raise your electronic blue hand and wait to be called. All councillors have been sent the agenda for today's meeting. Any member of the public who wishes to view the agenda can do so by visiting our website at eastevan.gov.uk. We will now uh, start the meeting by doing a ro roll call of committee members here present. Can you please now unmute your microphones and when you can hear your name, please confirm by saying present. When you're confirmed you're present, please mute your microphone again. Okay, so starting with you, Councillor Ledger. Present. Thank you. Councillor Davy, please. Oh, present. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Okay, that is a no. Councillor Arnott, please. Present. Thank you. Councillor Blakey, please. Present. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Take that as a no. Councillor Hayward, please. Present, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hookway, please. Present, thank you. you. Councillor Howe. Present. Councillor Ingham. Present. Councillor McLaughlin. Present. Councillor Moulding, please. Present. Thank you. Councillor Rylance. Present. Thank you, uh, Councillor Skinner. Present. Please. Thank you, and Councillor Thomas, please. Present. Thank you. We are court chairman, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. So agenda item one is public speaking. We've got three members of uh, the public all wishing to speak on agenda item 12. Uh, all members of the public have indicated prior to the meeting that they wish to speak at the agenda item instead of during uh, public speaking. What I'd like to do is ask the committee is whether we could bring forward agenda item 12 to agenda item 7 so the, the members of the public can be heard early and we can move the agenda forward. Does any committee member have an issue with that? If you could just raise your electronic blue hand if you do. No, thanks very much. So we'll move on. Agenda item number two, minutes of the previous meeting. Um, if anyone has any comments on the sets of minutes from the 16th of September 2020, please do this by raising your electronic blue hand. If no blue hands are raised, I'll take that as an indication that you all agree to the minutes. Looking for blue hands. So those minutes are agreed. Agenda item number three, apologies. Wendy, do we have any apologies? No, no apologies received. Thank you. So agenda item four, declarations of interest. So this will be done via a roll call. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you. So I'll do this in alphabetical order. So starting with Councillor Arnott. Uh, none, Chair. Councillor Blakey. None, thank you. Councillor Davey. Um, <clears throat> town councillor at Exmouth Town Council. I think that's probably relevant to item 13, the uh, S106 and SIL funding report. Thank you. Councillor Hayward. 
Uh, yes, um, personal interest is the clerk to All Saints, Charge Stock and Newton Popperford and Hartford Parish Councils in respect of items 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13 and 14. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hookway. Board member for Exmouth Littleham. Thank you. For item 13, thank you. Councillor Howe. Uh, parish Councillor for Bishop's Cliss Parish Council and Cliss St Mary, which covers virtually all of them apart from, I think, uh, where was I? One of them didn't. Um, 12 and, uh, oh, East Budley, 15. All the rest, I suppose, one way and another. So excluding 12 and 15. Yeah, all the rest I probably have an influence on. Thank you. Councillor Ingham? None. Councillor Ledger? Uh, as the agenda, so agenda item 12, I'm a ward member for Seaton, uh, and then 13, uh, town councillor at Seaton as well. Thank you. Councillor McLaughlin? None. Councillor Moulding? None. Councillor Rylance. Uh, yes, so Parish Councillor for Broadcast Parish Council, District Councillor for Broadcast Ward, um, and as for Councillor Howe, I probably have a personal interest in practically everything apart from 12 and 15. Thank you, 12 and 15. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Uh, none that I'm aware of, I'm sure. If there is, I shall let you know. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Thomas. Um, yes, I believe I should. There's a property I own features on one of the maps in connection with item 12. Item 12. Uh, so property you own features on one of the maps. That's correct. I don't know, it doesn't, that, that doesn't affect me taking part in the debate or anything, does it? It depends on what um, interest you're declaring, whether it's a disclosable pecuniary interest, in which case it would, or if it is a personal interest, in which case it wouldn't. I have no idea. <laughs> it basically, it simply, uh, the one of the maps, one of, one of the properties featured on the map near to a cliff top is one I own. So you now, whether that makes it personal or not, I don't know. <laughs> Pecuniary, it surely. Pecuniary. I'm if, sorry, if, Councillor Howe. Uh, sorry, I mean, Councillor Howe said pecuniary. I mean, I, I agree. You know, if the case that yes. uh, East Devon, you know, did something that stops your property falling into the sea, that's a pecuniary interest. Uh, I don't honestly think uh, there's any prospect of East Devon doing it. To say whose interests are, are what, it's down to the council themselves to decide whether it's a personal or pecuniary. I don't think we should be weighing in on the debate. No, it is for you, Councillor Thomas. If you've declared the property on your register of uh, interests, uh -huh. then that is that is an indication that uh, you may consider you have a disclosable pecuniary interest in the item. Fine. Well, what should I do then, Shirley? It, it, it is for you to decide. I'm no, no, I mean, it, do, does that mean, do I need to switch off and drop out while you debate it, that or what? It, it does. It means that we will put you in the waiting room whilst that item is uh, discussed and you can't take part in the debate or in or part in the uh, vote, I'm afraid. If that well, is what no, that's declaring. okay with me. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we now have Councillor Allen in the room. Um, Councillor Allen, um, hoping you can hear me. Do you have any declarations of interest? No declarations of interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's the um, over to you, Chairman. Very much, Wendy. So we move on to agenda item five, matters of urgency. There are none. Uh, agenda item six, confidential and exempt items. There are no confidential exempt items which officers recommend should be dealt with in this way. Uh, agenda item seven is now uh, what was previously agenda item 12. 
So if we could please have the public speakers, uh, we'll start with Richard Ely, if you have three minutes, can you unmute your microphone and go when you're ready? Just need to put Councillor Thomas yeah, okay, in Jim? the waiting room. Okay. Okay. Apo uh, apologies, Richard. Just wait two seconds while we remove one councillor. <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Sidmouth Chamber of Commerce regarding the Plymouth University report on predicted erosion rates, in particular those for the eastern part of Sidmouth. We support the four recommendations from the officers. This report is pretty explosive. We agree the need to quickly explain the implications for our residents, and we particularly agree that cabinet should urgently consider this matter. We would go further and recommend an immediate suspension of the Sidmouth Beach Management Plan and a wholesale review. Not starting all over again, but a new evidence-based, clear thinking, open-minded approach. How can we carry on as if nothing's happened when we have this report? I must stress, however, that there is no reason at all for granting this algorithm-based report any special status within the development of a new local plan. There are numerous professional estimates predicting erosion on our coastline. This Plymouth report makes startling and questionable projections which should set alarm bells ringing. Methodology is experimental and, I repeat, algorithmic. The agenda says that the report uses groundbreaking and pioneering methodology. That says it all, really. Plymouth uses untried and experimental mathematical techniques. So we should treat this report with great caution. It is probably badly wrong. I prefer reports by experienced geomorphologists and geologists to desktop algorithmic calculations. Notwithstanding our scepticism, Plymouth has not placed a question mark over the Sidmouth Beach Management Plan it has pretty much destroyed it. The feeble preferred option does not deal with the erosion anticipated by our consultant and SMP2. Plymouth predicts Sidmouth erosion 10 times faster than that. Does anyone believe that the preferred option can deal with the Plymouth scenario? Of course it can't. So this report, whilst a huge challenge for Sidmouth, may ultimately do our town a favor. It gives us the opportunity to look afresh at the whole process and reset the BMP. Let's put the BMP on a professional footing, adopt a rigorous and vigorous but calm approach and get this job done. We can collectively agree a viable way forward by Christmas. We have obtained estimates from major UK contractors that are massively lower than the consultants have provided for EDDC. We already know that options previously dismissed as unaffordable by EDDC are not. All well-run beach management plans are constantly under review. Good authorities do this automatically. We should not ignore what is standard practice elsewhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ely. Uh, Martin Shaw, whenever Thank you. you have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I'm the... Uh, County Councillor for Seton and Collerton. I'm also a resident of Seton Hall, which is affected by this uh, study, and uh, a founder member of the West Seton and Seton Hall Association. And I want to raise concerns on behalf of uh, our members and the residents of, of West Seton. Uh, the, the, I, uh, in general, I, I welcome uh, this new study, although I, I think there probably are a lot, a lot of questions that need to be asked about it. Uh, but the, the, the Previous uh, line, lines drawn by the beach management plan were in many ways, uh, by the shoreline management plan, sorry, were in many ways uh, counterintuitive and uh, did not seem to correspond to the, 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 the pat pattern of, of erosion in recent times. Uh, the, I think one, one of the questions that needs to be looked at really is uh, whether uh, we have actually been operating under uh, potentially misleading uh, guidelines from the uh, SMP for a considerable period. And as far as Seton is concerned, it seems to me that first of all, we, we need to uh, examine whether the, the lesson, the, the, uh, the, the reading of this Plymouth study uh, indicates that the assumption of the 
shoreline management plan that the western side of Seatman should be a management realignment zone is, is sustainable because this study suggests that there would be much more serious uh, damage to property and also to the road between Seaton and Beer, uh, which have got much more fundamental implications for uh, the, the, the residents of Seaton. And so I think we need uh, to, first of all, question the assumptions of the, the shoreline management plan. Secondly, we need to look at the beach management plan, uh, which uh, so also, I think, is operating on uh, a bit like the, the uh, suggestion from Sidmouth on, on two limited uh, uh, a framework uh, is, is operating on the assumption that we only need to deal uh, with the uh, erosion from below, where we know that the erosion uh, from above, uh, the, the rainfall erosion which caused the uh, 2012 landslip in Old Beer Road, that uh, is the is at least a bigger part of the problem, and that is likely to be a very serious part of the problem that's been uh, indicated by the this new study. So we need to look at the, the uh, beach management plan and to, to I think, to have, a, again, a much more ambitious plan. So too many of the uh, relevant options were ruled out on the grounds of cost. We have now apparently closed the gap on the options that we, we have adopted. But uh, I think the, the lesson of this report is, is probably that we need to, to have a fundamental relook at this. So I, I would like to see a meeting of the stakeholder uh, group, and, and I would offer offer to the the help of the West Seaton Association in communication strategy to residents, which is really important. Thank you, Councillor Shaw. Um, lastly, we have Karen Boys. Karen, you have three minutes whenever you're ready. Hello, um, I, I'm just speaking as a local resident who lives near the cliff, a cliff in Seton Hole. Um, I obviously don't have the expertise about the what's being managed in terms of the cliffs, etc. Um, having geophysicists in the family, we've um, established that our property is on the white side, the white cliff side of a fault line. So. Um, the, the main problem is on the Redcliffe side, which is the, the, the section that Mr Shaw has been referring to. Um, the, the questions I, I wish to put is, um, and I, I suppose they're along the lines that um, we've heard from Sidmouth and Mr Shaw. Um, I, I was a bit, I'm a bit concerned about what I perceive as a lack of investment in the area generally. Um, obviously, tourism is, is a huge, um, hugely important uh, feature, particularly around Seaton. And uh, I, I was just basically wanting to ask about the provision of, of uh, the Southwest Coastal Path, because um, it's getting quite uh, scary, if I put it that way. If you go from Seaton along the cliff to beer, it's sort of disappearing off the cliff. Um, and there has to be um, rules about that, I would think. Um, I personally find that that is a particular concern. Um, I'm sorry to be so focused on small things when we're looking at a major um, issue. And um, I have tried the route, um, inland route. Uh, and I think, again, this is important for the Southwest Coastal Path and Tourism, but that, means that you whilst there's been efforts to put some of that path in fields some of that uh, route takes you on to um, the road which is two two lanes fast and dangerous um, so it it perhaps more generally I know you're looking at quite a section of post of um, coast um, my my questions really are what are you going to do about those two sections of path between Seaton and Beer and obviously that's something to be taken into account in any big picture that you'll be dealing with and the final matter is the actual access to the beach at Seaton Hole um, I'd suggest is quite poor it's not disability friendly um, given you've got another view as to the future of that area, perhaps some kind of beach access and disability ac uh, friendly access could be incorporated into any future plans around Seaton Hall. Um, and it seems to me, I'm not an expert, but having looked at the plan, um, they would, Seaton itself seems to be quite well looked after and uh, in terms of the, the sea and erosion, but there seems to be a bit of a gap 
um, around Seton Hall to Beer. And perhaps now there's a second opinion on what's going on seawise. That might be an opportunity to look at the Southwest Coastal Path and the access to the beach. Uh, again, um, I'm sorry, it seems quite quite focused <laughs> compared to obviously the other speakers who are dealing uh, much more on a much more bigger picture basis. Um, and uh, hey, time's I, up now, I'm afraid, if you can bring that to a close. Yeah, thank it. you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Boyd. So if we uh, will look to take the agenda report from Mr. Freeman. Ed, whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so as you've heard, um, this report seeks to highlight work that Plymouth University have been doing to develop a methodology for defining areas that may be affected by physical changes to the coast over the next 100 years. And they've used the East Devon coastline from Sidmouth to the edge of Lyme Regis as a, as a pilot study area. The plans look at likely impacts over a 20, 50 and 100 year periods, taking into account coastal erosion but also other factors such as increases in the rate of sea level rises due to climate change, which could also have a significant impact on coastal change as well. The maps that have been produced and are appended to the report uh, then identify areas which will be potentially impacted by coastal change on the basis of a worst case scenario and also with a 10 metre buffer added. In projecting the worst case scenario, the data uses data that reflects a precautionary approach such as, as I said, projections for the impact of climate change, where high emissions data has been used uh, as a precautionary approach, which is the approach endorsed by the Environment Agency. Clearly, we hope that action on climate change will hopefully prevent such high levels of emissions uh, being reality and, and therefore some of the impacts being projected here being realised. Um, but as I've said, this takes very much a worst case scenario approach to this work. Uh, it's also worth noting that the work does not take account of coastal protection measures that are being planned. So you've heard about the beach management plans in Seaton and Sidmouth. Um, and, and obviously these could reduce the extent of the change being forecast in this work. Um, the work is very much for a planning purpose, um, as I said, and should not be assumed to affect the, these wider pieces of work where a different methodology is appropriate. It is, however, proposed to use the study in the production of the new local plan to identify coastal change management areas where particular policies may be needed to affect what is acceptable in planning terms in these areas, acknowledging the potential coastal changes that may be seen during the plan period and indeed beyond. It is, however, acknowledged that this information will no doubt be of grave concern to effective, affected residents. And so members are asked to consider the next step section of the report and the potential further communication on this study that might be needed. Um, members should also note that a press release was released early last week in advance of this meeting, and this sought to highlight the difference between this work and previous studies and work ongoing on beach management plans. However, further communication may be considered necessary. There are also further wider implications of this study uh, in terms of the work needed for uh, the local plan, um, and its impact potentially on uh, the beach management plans, for example. And so one of the recommendations is that um, members ask Cabinet to consider these issues at a future meeting. Aside from this, members are asked to note the study and the further work that is needed to complete the work for the remainder of the coastline of the district and the work needed to produce coastal change management areas through the local plan process. Thank you. One of the key things to, to note in this is that we should be focusing on just the planning issues within this meeting. We shouldn't be looking outside and as the recommendations say, it sh it, that can be fully aired uh, during cabinet. So if we can focus just on the planning issues, because I can understand we might be getting into a really long debate about something that isn't specific to the, to the planning committee. So if we start uh, outside of the committee with Councillor Rylance, I'm inside the committee chair. Apologies. So if you're outside of the committee, uh, inside the committee, sorry, could you put your hands down and we'll just speak to the members outside? So Councillor Young. That'll be me then. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I hear what uh, Mr. Ely uh, is um, asking regarding the beach management plan, uh, but as you say, uh, we're discussing this uh, uh, this uh, paper today and not a beach management plan. Um, what what is a coastal change management area? Um, it says that. It, uh, Interactions between uh, coastal change and new development or infrastructure, uh, infrastructure uh, proposals or relocation of existing development or infrastructure is required. However, they should not need to be used where an accepted shoreline management plan uh, policy is uh, to hold or advance the line. Uh, we are a local planning authority and we need to demonstrate that we have considered shore management plans. If we are to uh, propose an area for uh, coastal change management area, it is incumbent, incumbent on us to use the best available information. In the case of Seton Hole and Sidmouth, uh, we are at present working on beach management plans, uh, which is the best available uh, information. Remember, this is a pilot of a proposal, uh, a larger piece of work, based only on the last 20 years of data and then using a simple genetic algorithm uh, model uh, and when completed uh, it will include all this co uh, coastline excluding the uh, major towns. The report however does highlight severe coastal change predictions um, which could happen to our coast due to changing climate and sea levels if uh, we do nothing. That's why we are working with partners to do what we can to protect our coastal communities and work with nature to protect our natural habitat. Regarding the uh, recommendation, um, I would suggest that we change some of the recommendations. Uh, uh, I would uh, recommend changing uh, number uh, one to, to thank the university for providing the results on the pilot scheme and to discuss with them how this work can be amalgamated with the recent and planned engineering flood and coastal schemes to provide a better case scenario for planning guidance purposes. Um, I agree with, uh, uh, with two. Uh, and I agree with three, um, but with four, uh, I would uh, prefer that, uh, that members recommend that further specialist combined work is carried out, uh, combining uh, the planning requirements and engineering hold the line solutions to provide a more fully informed paper uh, before it goes to cabinet. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Young. Does any other member from outside of the committee wish to speak at this moment? No, so we'll just take it back into the committee. Councillor Mike Howe. Yeah, I'll actually listen to Jeff's and, uh, comments and funny enough, I came to the exact same conclusion. Um, this is a hypothetical paper um, because it's untested, um, but it doesn't take into account the current proposed shoreline management plans and defences that are in the pipeline, I believe fully funded. So it does need more work, um, but it mustn't also at the same time drag on. It has to be done quickly. So I'm nervous about using an untested and incomplete paper for planning purposes. And actually we go along with Jeff's recommendation. So I would like to propose those amendments to the recommendation, please. Um, and hopefully we'll get a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Howe. Do I have uh, anyone want to second yeah, that? Yeah, happy to second that. Paul Arnott here, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Arnott. Okay, so carrying on with the debate. Councillor Violence, you're up next. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as far as I, I can understand, Mr Freeman, this is actually a worst case scenario, isn't it? What, what we're being presented with at the moment. It's just so that we avoid building things um, in places that may, in time, should the worst happen, be underwater. 
and I noted that um, that oh, there, there was there was some some um, some what's the word there there was a there was nuances within the report about what could be built and obviously it makes a lot of sense that we should be able to build something that might last will need to only be needed for a few years versus being allowed to build buildings which one would normally expect to last 100 or 150 years and I'm wondering in line of what uh, what was in the report about the environment agency updating um updating their their um evidence to reflect current research whether the same is happening for inland flooding issues um, and whether in planning terms we're going to be able to have some inland um, flood maps that actually reflect the reality on the ground and I know that's got nothing to do with coastal management but I'm just wondering whether we are going to be able to produce planning policies that reflect what is actually currently happening to the climate um, and whether you know we are going to get some reliable information out of the environment agency on surface water flooding which actually is not unconnected to coastal erosion as well um, so that's my question for mr freeman thank you councillor rylance i think we'll go through a few more members and then bring ed in after after a couple more so if we go to councillor nick hookway next uh, thank you chair uh yes um i would um, interested to hear Councillor Young's um, comments regarding the recommendations. I was quite happy with the recommendations as they are uh, in, in uh, the connection with um, other comments. I don't believe we should re review this as hypothetical. This is a, a problem. This is an issue that's going to be uh, something that we're all going to have to face. Um, I've been to conferences where sea level changes in Lyme Bay have been discussed. There's a lot of data. Perhaps the algorithm is wrong this time, but they'll get it right later on. We are looking for something that is going to be a, uh, a process that is going to affect uh, our district. And uh, this is uh, probably a start of the process uh, and a start of the discussion about how we're going to deal with this issue in the long term. Um, however, as uh, recommendations have been altered, I'm quite happy to uh, vote on those and accept those um, uh, as and when necessary. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hookway. Councillor Ingham next, then whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, I, I, I was tending to agree with Councillor Hookway. Um, what I'm most interested to hear is what Mr. Freeman has to say to de defend his recommendations and whether he subscribes to the amendments or whether he sees flaws in making those amendments so that that will guide us on whether we support or different the, the um, amendments. Um, I think the recommendations we have before us are pretty clear and, and they're loose enough to be workable. So I'm reticent about putting in amendments that uh, clutter the vision and the way forward. I want to hear what Ed has to say. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ian. We'll bring in Ollie Davy and then we'll go to Ed Freeman. So, Ollie. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, the one thing you can usually say about predictions is that they're going to be wrong. Um, they are, and, and the more specific they are, the, the more likely they are to be wrong. Um, so they are frequently inaccurate. Unfortunately, sometimes, you, you disregard that at your cost. And climate scientists are finding, in fact, having predicted, for instance, rates of loss of ice sheets that are actually disappearing faster than was predicted. So I think we ignore this at our peril. I think it's been very useful, this report, in highlighting some of the shortcomings of the current shoreline management plan, particularly the fact that there are variations in the rates of erosion along the cliffs. And I think that is one of the most useful aspects of this report, is the shoreline management plan applies a kind of formula across the whole coastline, whereas this highlights the fact that actually rates of erosion are, are different in different places. And one of the most worrying aspects is that those are often in the most populated areas. So, so obviously we don't want to ignore this, particularly for planning changes. And I think the fact that uh, Plymouth University have looked at worst case scenarios and applied a precautionary principle, I think we should do the same. 
Um, and, and I think we should be taking this into consideration for planning purposes uh, and ensuring that we don't site buildings that are likely to have uh, a fairly, well, you would hope a long lifespan um, in areas where the, the Plymouth study has suggested that there could be a, a higher than expected level of erosion. So um, I, I am happy with the recommendation as it stands. I, I quite like Jeff's idea of thanking Plymouth University for their work, um, but I, I don't think we should remove uh, recommendation one that we note it for planning purposes. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Ed, I think this would be a good time for you to come in and just answer a few of the questions if possible. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Happy to. Um, I mean, on, on the fundamental issue that's uh, been raised by, by Councillor Young, um, I mean, my preference uh, and the reason for the recommendations really is that I, I do feel that we need to keep planning separate from the design of coastal defences. Um, this study, as I understand it, has deliberately taken a worst case scenario approach and deliberately not taken proposed coastal defences into account as part of that. What we're talking about is identifying areas in a future local plan where certain forms of development might not be appropriate because in a worst case scenario, plus a 10 metre buffer, they might be vulnerable to, to change. Um, and I, I think that's an appropriate approach for us to take as a local planning authority um, and to echo that precautionary approach that the Environment Agency also endorsed, because as has been said, forecasts and predictions are, are just that. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, and so from the point of view of planning authority, I think we should be taking a precautionary approach um, and, and restricting or having policies that control development in areas that, that might be affected by this in a worst case scenario. The design of coastal defences, to my mind, is, is very different from that. Um, in that um, you have to design those on, on a different basis and not necessarily based on that absolute worst case scenario, plus buffers, etc. Um, so I do see them as separate issues and I do um, would stand by the recommendations and would much rather stick to the precautionary approach that the study has, has taken. Um, with regard to Councillor Rylance's point, um, I would say that in terms of, well, in terms of all of the work, as far as I'm aware that the Environment Agency do, they always take a precautionary approach. Um, so their inland flood maps, etc., all echo that, that approach, um, which, which they endorse and is uh, reinforced in government guidance. As I've said, uh, all of this work is based on predictions and forecasts. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. Therefore, from a planning perspective, in, in all our work on these types of issues, whether along the coast or inland, we, we seek to adopt a precautionary approach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Um, going back to Councillor Mike Cow. Um, having listened to that and having worked out what Jeff said, I would like to add back in, um, Jeff wanted to change um, item one. I would like to item one to stay as it is and listening to, the, uh, to, to what has been said, but add a line five, which is to thank the university for providing the results on the pilot scheme and to discuss with them how this work can be amalgamated with a recent and planned engineering flood and coastal schemes to provide a best case scenario going forward, removing out the planning guidance purposes. Um, I think we need to push this to cabinet, no disrespect to anyone. I think we also need to, at the same time, heed Ed's words and not change his basis of principles, but we need to make the point this is not a complete piece of work. Um, we have to take a cautionary point of view, but at the same time, we need to highlight the others. And I hope Councillor Arnott might accept that uh, change to my recommendation. Thank you. Mike, just for clarity, can you just go through the points? Just It's more for Shirley's benefit here. Can you just go through the points again and just itemize basically what you're proposing. Okay, one, two, and three from Ed, Mr. Freeman's recommendations stay exactly the same. We then add in, well, change four, to um, members recommend that further specialist combined work is carried out, combining the planning requirements and engineering hold the line solution to provide a more fully informed paper for cabinet. 
not for planning, for cabinet that is. I would also then like to add line five, to thank the university for providing the results on the pilot scheme and discuss with them how this work can be amalgamated with the recent and planned engineering flood and coastal schemes to provide a best case scenario for planning guidance purposes for cabinet. Thank you, Mike. Shelley, is that okay? If, <laughs> if that could possibly be emailed or text to me, that would be a great help because I've got most of it, but not all of it. And I wouldn't like to mislead members with what the recommendations are, please. Give me a second, Shirley. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Arno, are you happy to still second that? Or yeah, I, I was, I was as, as a short chair, I was literally coming in with a blue hand after Mike before. I knew what he'd say, he's such a wise man, and I agree with every word of it. Happy to, happy to accept all of that. Um, in, in a sense, the first one, you kind of, all we do is noting it. We're not actually endorsing it or anything like that, so it has absolutely no harm. And I think the other additions um, through Mike from Jeff Young are invaluable. So thank you, Chair, happy to accept that. Thank you, Councillor Arna. So if we go to Councillor Rylance next, and then I think it's time to bring this to a vote. So Councillor Rylance. I actually, thank you, Chair. Um, I actually, I'm not convinced that of the validity of the, and, and the point of drawing up a best case scenario. I mean, best case scenario, given everything we could, we, we, we we read and everything we see and all the predictions mapped out would be that it doesn't get any worse than it is now. Um, and so in, in, in that respect, we know that global warming is happening. We know that the seas are rising. Um, the, the, the only question is by how much at the moment. And by best case scenario, we're looking at by how much they will rise. Um, but at the moment, this very much depends on mitigation measures used, used across the world to, to, to limit um, uh, CO2 emissions and I'm not entirely certain that we should be proceeding um, for planning purposes or any other purposes with a best case scenario document because that will basically mirror what we have already. I'd much rather see a most likely scenario based on all the available evidence mapping than a best case scenario because I'm, I'm not sure we're going to learn very much from a best case scenario other than gain a bit of false reassurance about what's likely to happen in the next 20 to 30 years you know and 100 years possibly. Um, so I, I'm not convinced we should be going for a best case scenario. Sorry, guys. Um, so it, it, can we come to some kind of compromise about what sort of format we'd like if we don't, if we'd want an alternative opinion, so to say, to worst case scenario? Because I really don't think best case scenario is what we're looking, we should be, we should be spending money on. Best case scenario is what we've got already at the moment. So, you know, can we, can we talk about this maybe? I know you probably want to move on, Chair but I'm not sure it's worth spending money on getting a best case scenario model, to be honest. Councillor Hines. Um, Councillor Cathy McLaughlin, you came in just before I said that we were gonna move on, so. Uh, yeah, I did share, um, and Eleanor has just voiced everything I was going to say. Um, we're, we're talking about scenarios, which, um, you know, it's not it's not definite, it's not fact, it is a scenario. And as Eleanor, um, Councillor Rylance just said, we want the most likely, not the best, um, possibly the most likely or the worst to work with. Um, so th that's what I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you, Cathy. Um, I think with what we've got in front of us now that it's, um, is for the planning purpose is the worst case scenario it's quite right chair and that's what's going to be used for the planning purposes regardless of any impact or uh, repercussions from what the bmps are proposing and i think using a worst case scenario for planning purposes is, is what is the conservative and most proper thing to do um we don't have any more blue hands. I think it's it's time to take this to a vote now. So, Shelley, can you just recap on what the recommendations are, if possible? <laughs> I have I have printed them off. The councillor how managed to get them through to me. Okay, the recommendation one is the same: that erosion lines to Sidmouth to Lyme Regis coast are noted for planning purposes. 
recommendation two, that the proposed methodology is noted for any further work on the remainder of East Devon coast and for any designation of coastal change management areas through the local plan process. Recommendation three, that the proposed next steps are considered and an approach to communicating the issues highlighted in this report to affected residents and businesses are agreed. Now the, the two changes are that recommendation four, that members recommend that further specialist combined work is carried out combining the planning requirements and engineering hold the line solutions to provide a more fully informed paper for cabinet and recommendation five to thank the university for providing the results on the pilot scheme and to discuss with them how this work can be amalgamated with the recent and planned engineering flood and coastal schemes to provide a best case scenario for planning guidance purposes. I hope that was clear to members. Now, if you would um, please press your yes button if you are in support of the, the motion. Madam Chair, press... Mr. Chair, sorry. I'm not uh, Madam. <laughs> I know, terribly sorry. I was I'm getting cross. I mistyped there and I just need to correct the last one because I don't want the a best case scenario for planning guidance purposes. I want a best case scenario for cabinet to work through. There is a subtle change. We work in, as Mr. Freeman has pointed out, we work for worst case scenario in planning. This is a recommendation to cabinet as well that they work through for the best case scenario for the community. Can I just confirm that is as understood by your seconder as well, Councillor Arnott? If that distinction is understood. Thank you very much, Shirley. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you, my mistake. Therefore, members, please press your yes button if you are in support of that motion. Please press your no button if you're against the motion. And please raise your blue hand to indicate if you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. For the benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place. And no abstentions, Chair, and that motion is carried. Thank you very much, Debbie and Shirley. So if we move back into the uh, agenda to agenda item seven, which is the review of East Devon local plan. So it's over to Ed Freeman again for another report. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So uh, this first item in terms of the local plan um, relates to the existing local plan and members will be aware that the local plan was adopted in January 2016 uh, and so turns five years old in January. We are required to carry out a review within the five years and so we've undertaken a review using a toolkit produced by the planning advisory service. The completed toolkit is appended to the report and highlights some key areas where a variety of issues apply, either the local plan does not fully reflect the requirements of the NPPF. Uh, in some cases, there have been significant changes in economic conditions. Uh, some key allocations have not come forward. New sites have been identified through further work, uh, including work done for the Great Extra Strategic Plan. Uh, key infrastructure projects have stalled in some cases. Not all policies are achievable and effective in a few cases, and there have been obviously local political changes, all of which lead to a need for a wider review of, of the local plan indeed. Um, it, it basically tells us what we already knew, which is that we need to produce a new local plan. Um, so this really takes us through the formal process of, of reaching that conclusion and, and, and documents that process. Uh, in terms of other consequences, it, it highlights a number of next steps in the report, uh, including the fact that obviously changes to how the five-year land supply position is calculated uh, would come in at, at the five years, um, albeit obviously noting the consultation work that the government's currently doing that was discussed at the previous meeting. Um, the end result of all of this is that clearly we don't bin the local plan after five years. Uh, but we need to be mindful as decision makers uh, that the weight that can be attributed to policies that are not in complete alignment with the NPPF um, has to be considered. 
Um, and the work done in the toolkit that's appended to the report will hopefully help officers and members to understand where this is the case and the weight to be attributed to those policies. Um, you'll see from the recommendations that it's recommended that members consider and agree the findings under the toolkit approach, agree that officers discuss these findings with duty to cooperate bodies and note the next steps in the report and the consequences of the local plan turning five years old as detailed in the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. So we'll start outside of the committee first. If any member outside of the committee wishes to speak, if you just raise your electronic blue hand now. No one wishing to speak. Okay, so we'll take it inside the committee. Committee members raise their electronic blue hands if they wish to speak. Councillor Howe, go ahead. It could be a long day. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair and Mr. Freeman, for his long and complicated work to get to this stage. Um, I'm sure it's been a stressful few months over the last few months while he's been trying to do this. Um, I have no real problems. I, th I think the report is fairly succinct in most of its cases. Um, very long-winded, very um, uh, in detailed with all the data underneath it. Um, and as at this minute in time, I have no decision as to which way we should be recommending the shorter or the faster approach to this, but I do have some concerns I need to highlight to start with. And that is starting on page 22. Um, on section A, housing and employment land availability assessment. The lovely Chair, point of order. Fine. I think my right. sort of the next agenda item. Yeah. You, I was Sorry. just about to come into that. We're from pages 13 to 16. My mistake. Terribly sorry, I'll take it back. Go on. Go, go next, I'll come back. Okay, no problem. Councillor Rylance? Thank you, Chair. Okay, I've got, sorry, a number of scrawled notes. I apologise about this. Um, okay, so A9, Mr Freeman. But I think I kind of already asked that question in, in the last item about surface flood water um, and how, you know, how it would end, in, end up informing our planning going forwards. Um, because it's clear to me that the environment agency maps that we're using for surface water are not up to the job anymore. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what, whether the environment agency is revising those in light of you know, what's actually happening on the ground. Um, so that was my question about A9 and whether there actually is cause to disagree there because we are experiencing increasing surface water flooding. Um, A11, about the delivery of infrastructure, what can we do about this? So if we've got stalled infrastructure projects, how can we tackle them? I mean, surely that's one of the things we should be doing, not just noting them as a comment. Um, yes, we need some infrastructure, definitely. Um, but what I'm sensing threaded through this document is a slight amount of frustration at the, at the impossibility of having an infrastructure delivered under the current planning model. Um, and what can we do about it is how we should be proceeding, to my view. I, I, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine why we didn't even consider building 7,000 houses in or 7,900 houses in 10 years without knowing how we're going to deliver the infrastructure for them. I mean, what are we doing to our area if we do that? Um, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Oh, yes. Chapter four, par, sub chapter one, sub chapter A. Where was that? That's probably in the next document, actually. Don't, don't mind me. That will come up later. Yeah, all the rest of them are coming up later. So those are my three, those are my three questions, actually, mostly to do with the delivery of infrastructure. How do we achieve it? How do we plan for it? Um, and how do we deliver it in a timely fashion to, to be in parallel with any planning and development that we do? Thank you, Councillor Rylance. We'll go through a few more members and then go bring Ed in again later on. So Councillor Mike Allen. Mike, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Dan. I'd just make a couple of points, um, maybe three. Um, I wonder if Mr Freeman will let us know if, in terms of procedure, uh, when he comes to number eight, it, will he be following the 
PAS toolkit for procedure and for number four for evaluation. And just a bit of pre-warning for him. As regards the uh, existing uh, number seven item, I'd refer please to the PAS toolkit and section A5 uh, where it talks about economic land availability and the assumption is that everything's going well in the comments that he's made and I don't think that's necessarily true from two viewpoints. Number one, we haven't been delivering the economic land that we wanted to uh, except in the west area of the East Devon and secondly we really don't know what the configuration of uh, business premises is needed with Covid completely altering the landscape of whether people work at home or not or whether they work in small um, clusters or not and it makes a big difference. Now I do appreciate that if this plan evaluation is going to take three long years and end up with us being completely uh, in error because we'll be three years past the due date for a review, I am just very concerned as to when and how we can actually figure out fast what the trends are in economic premises that we're going to have to plan for. The past is a dead country when it comes to the economy. We're in a new world now and I don't think we can say that uh, Mr Freeman's answer to A5 in the toolkit is actually any longer accurate. Thank you Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Um, moving on to Councillor Ingham. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to propose the recommendations as printed. Um, I think uh, Councillor Allen has some, made some very good points there that we must be concerned about. Allen was right to be concerned about the infrastructure, primarily because uh, this council has thrown out GASP where we had direct access and input to controlling the infrastructure throughout the whole of the greater Exeter area. But now we've got to go back and start from scratch, which seems a, a, a dumb thing to have decided to do. The least we can do is to uh, support these recommendations and get cracking. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ingham. So that's been proposed. Is there anyone wishing to second that? Yes, Councillor Skinner is. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Councillor Skinner, do you have anything else you wish to add? Yes I, it... yes, I do. I do wish to uh, add, add to that. The recommendations are really quite clear. We need to move, uh, uh, um, clear this up and move forward as quick as we can. The last thing we want, and I've been in an administration when we lost our five-year housing land supply, and the last thing we want is to lose our five-year housing land supply. It's incredulous that when you do that, of course, you end up with developments taking place where we don't want to see them happen. And that is a really upsetting and a really bad place to be. And I'm going to actually in, in counteract, not sorry, not counteract, but support what Councillor Ingham was saying. In fact, what Councillor Ryland suggested was well, where is, uh, you know, we need infrastructure, where is that? Well, actually that was coming through the guest process. You decided to put that in the bin. So actually um, you'd have to say to yourself and going back to uh, once upon a time is creating a lot of work. And that's what by throwing the guest process out has actually created. But what I will say, is that some of that work that would have been done is obviously still there and some of those that stuff surely we can pick up on and pull that forward and bring it forward in the way we're going forward with our local plan with some of it as we go forward so it's not exactly starting with a, a blank sheet but uh, but we'll have to see where that goes so i'm going to support on the basis in of the recommendations that put forward within the, within the document uh, councillor ingham in his suggestion of uh, supporting those recommendations three recommendations i'm supporting those and seconding it mr chairman thank you thank you councillor skinner i think if uh, members want to look forward to agenda item eight that's how that is um 
going to suggest a few ways in which we can utilize the evidence already created and a way forward of cooperating with neighboring authorities. But we'll save that for the next agenda item. Does any other member wish to speak or are they happy to take it to the vote? No members wish to speak, so I'll hand over to Democratic Services to take the vote. If I may just clarify the uh, recommendations and the motion, Chair, firstly. Oh, sorry, um, so, recommendation one, to consider and agree the findings of the toolkit, part one, East Devon Local Plan, 2013 to 2031 review assessment, which concludes that a full policies update to the local plan is required. Secondly, to agree that officers will discuss the findings of the local plan review assessment with the prescribed duty to cooperate bodies and then make any consequential amendments before finalising the review. Any significant comments that could potentially change the conclusion of the review will be brought back to the Strategic Planning Committee. And thirdly, to note the next day steps detailed in the report and consequences of the local plan turning five years old. Again, if you wish to uh, support the uh, motion, please press your yes button. If you wish to uh, vote against the motion, press your no button and raise your blue hand if you are abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Okay, for the benefit of those watching live, the vote is now taking place. And that is carried, Chair, thank you. Thank you, Demi and Shelley. So we'll move on to agenda item eight. Um, and again, it's over to Ed Freeman for another report. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, this report naturally follows on from the previous one um, in that it seeks to consider the work that is involved in the production of a new local plan, um, which hopefully members will notice is quite considerable. Um, the report considers two options in terms of a timeline and process for undertaking this work as well. Um, the differences between the two options detailed in the report are effectively the resources available and the level of engagement proposed with each option. So option one proposes the fastest possible timeline in, in my mind, which is adoption towards the end of 2023, um, but would place some constraints on the time available for consultation and engagement with this being based on legislative requirements uh, and engaging with members through meetings of, of this committee. It also would require two additional members of staff within the team to help with the workload that the policy planning policy team would under, need to undertake and reducing the timescales for various tasks involved in doing that. Um, option two, which um, adds about a year to that timescale um, uh, and would utilize only the existing resources within the policy team. Um, it would, however, provide more time for workshop sessions with members, town and parish councils, etc., that would not otherwise be feasible under option one. Um, it should, of course, be noted that at the present time, uh, and in at least short, short term, such sessions would be constrained by COVID-19 restrictions in any event. It's also worth noting that preparation of the last local plan was led by a member panel which while enabling greater member involvement did raise some issues of probity, probity at the time uh, and to some extent um, was, was considered to cause some delay. Um, so debating local plan issues within the public forum of strategic planning committee would appear to be the most transparent way of undertaking this work. Uh, the first stage of a plan production would be to consider the scope of the plan through an issues and options report. Uh, and section eight of the report before you seeks to consider the form and content of such a report. The intention would be to present a draft for members consideration at the next meeting, uh, which will be based on this structure uh, with a view to consulting on it early in the new year. Uh, members views on this structure and its content is, is sought through, through this report as well. Uh, the report before you also refers to further work on joint working um, further to members' resolution to withdraw from the Greater Exeter Strategic Plan and the need to satisfy the duty to cooperate. Um, as you'll be aware, there are significant benefits to working jointly with our neighbouring authorities in Greater Exeter uh, on common issues such as climate change, habitat mitigation, infrastructure delivery, uh, etc. And in terms of being able to achieve much more with the common approach and the power of such an approach in discussions with infrastructure providers, as has already been said, uh, and also in terms of conversations with government over potential benefits in seeking funding to support the delivery of infrastructure 
which is fundamentally the reason why in the previous report we were saying certain infrastructure had stalled. Uh, it's largely a funding issue um, and uh, securing funding for those projects has, has been difficult in recent times um, and no doubt will continue to be so. Um, concerns regarding the guest approach um, as detailed in previous discussions have been understood and noted and a new approach based around a non-statutory plan that sets out a non-binding vision and strategy for the area uh, is, is being discussed um, among the leaders um, and uh, it's considered that this could be developed alongside and informed by production of a new local plan um, so that the two could work in parallel with each other rather than I, I know members concern was that um, the GESP was, was sort of leading the way and the local plan would have to follow um, this new approach would enable the two to be developed in, more in parallel uh, informing each other um, and it would be a non-statutory plan and therefore not binding in the same way that the GESP would have been. Um, Obviously, there's various options for the scope of such a plan, um, but potentially it, it wouldn't, well, it wouldn't as a non-statutory plan include site allocations, which I know was another area of great concern to members uh, when guest was discussed. Um, so members are, are recommended to consider the two options for the new local plan production and identify their favoured approach. Uh, endorse production of an issues and options report for committee to consider at their December meeting and to recommend that Cabinet support the principle of production of a joint non-statutory plan for the Greater Exeter area, with further reports to follow which would detail the scope of that plan, the timetable for its production, the resources required and governance arrangements, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, firstly, we, again, we'll go to non-committee members. Does any non-committee member wish to speak at this time? When your screen goes blank and you can't see. Councillor Bond. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just um, wanted to urge the committee um, to really get a move on as quickly as possible and choose the, the speediest option to get a local plan in place. Um, uh, those of us that were uh, councillors. Unfortunately, Susie, we can't hear you at the moment. You, oh, at all, at all? Or? You've kept on breaking up there. Oh, okay, okay. I'll come back if I need to, thank it's you. Fine. It's fine now, try again. Right, I'm just urging the committee to get a move on really with, uh, with the whole process because those of us that were um, councillors when there wasn't a, a, a current um, uh, local plan, um, it, it was truly dire. Um, really um, a miserable time for all the communities outside the AONBs. But I just wanted to ask Mr. Freeman, if I may, um, that, that we're doing a, another um, HELAR process, a call for sites. Surely there cannot be a single piece of land in the Northwest Quadrant that hasn't already been put forward if that's what they wanted to put forward and has not been already assessed under the guest process. Do we have to go out again? Can we not pull that? in from the guest process as work that has been done. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. So does any other non-member wish to speak at this time? Ed Freeman, do you think you could just quickly answer the question for Susie and then we'll move into actual members of the committee? Uh, yes, certainly Chair. So. The, the intention is not to, to bin the previous HELAR. Obviously, we can still use uh, some of the evidence from that, but we need to be mindful that um, when it comes to examination of the local plan uh, in a couple, in sort of two, three years' time, that will be quite old. And so there's a need to make sure that we have a more up-to-date assessment to present uh, as part of that examination. So that's one of the reasons for doing it again. Um, the other one really is that the guest was obviously primarily focused on large strategic sites and while we did ask for all sites to come forward mindful that we could combine smaller sites, obviously the emphasis was on those larger strategic sites um, and so there is a high likelihood I think that perhaps some smaller sites didn't come forward through that process that we perhaps should be considering through a local plan process and so I think there is a benefit of doing that again to 
give people an opportunity to bring forward um, and help us identify more smaller sites, particularly given government guidance is now that we should be uh, allocating a large number of smaller sites as well as the large sites to help to encourage small and medium sized enterprises to bring forward developments um, and self build sites etc so the range and profile of sites we need has, has changed since that um, guest PLR process as well. Thanks very much so bring it into the committee Councillor Rylands first. Thank you Chair okay so thank you for this report Ed. Um, so ideally, obviously, we need, we, we need to have the local planners up to date. We need to review it straight away. I, I feel like there's probably a hybrid version, somewhere between option one and option two, because I think if, if the, the debacle of guests taught us anything, it's that we shouldn't proceed with this kind of large scale plan without community engagement and without, um, without considerable input from communities that, that are going to be affected. Um, I, I can see that there's a sort of siren attraction to option one, which is, you know, the most brutalist, efficient possible method, forging ahead with essentially minimal, minimal consultation. Um, I am wondering whether the, we can't combine elements of option two into option one, stick to broadly the same time frame, but actually consult as widely as possible. I mean, looking at option two, the timeline that we've got for option two, I note that there are much wider windows for certain things, and I'm wondering whether we can shrink those windows. Um, furthermore, if you, if, you, if you plod down option two timeline, um, there is actually at least four months that's completely fallow there, um, but from, from January 22 to, to the end of April 22, where there's essentially nothing in there. I'm just wondering what those are doing in there. I mean, that, is, it, is it some kind of buffer in case things overrun? In which case we should just not let things overrun. We, I mean, if we can do it in a brutal and, and extremely efficient manner, then why can we not apply efficiency to option two and, produ and produce it as fast as possible? Um, I just feel like the timeline for option two, which, is, which has got a, lot, got a lot more community engagement and should be preferable to us, um, is, is quite um, pessimistic, shall we say. Um, and I feel like option two could be delivered a lot faster than, than is suggested in the timeline. I mean, we have a lot of fallow months. We have um, committee approvals, which nominally in this timeline take a whole month, when clearly they wouldn't take a whole month. Um, because with ongoing work happening behind the scenes and, you know, in the previous periods, the, the, the documents will be drawn up. They just need to be presented to committee. I mean, it doesn't take a month to do that. So, you know, committee approval could happen in the same month as as the end of ongoing evidence and assessment. I just feel like option two is being presented as a much, much longer option when it needn't be. And I'm just wondering how other committee members feel about that. Thank you, Councillor Rylands. Uh, we've been joined by Councillor Chamberlain. Uh, Sarah, do you have any declarations of interest that you'd like to give at this time? We're on agenda item eight. Um, good afternoon, sorry, apologies. I got caught in, in another meeting. Um, no, my only declaration of interest would be when I'm a resident of Broadcliffe Station on the edge of um, Broadcliffe, uh, on the edge of Cranbrook, um, and um, I'm a ward member, obviously, for Broadcliffe Parish Council and that area, that's all. Thanks very much. Uh, so, moving back to Councillor Paul Arnott. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> obviously, nobody wants to relitigate in the past but it has been mentioned so let's just have some dates 23rd of July strategic planning meeting gave a recommendation to come to council it was in three parts one that we withdraw from GESP tick two that we continue with our duty to cooperate tick and three that we begin the process to start our local plan again, tick. So all of those things have been achieved by effectively Ed and a little bit of negotiation at, at the upper level in 40 working days since the 21st of August. And I would like to echo what I think Mike was gonna say earlier to thank him for this. This has been a hell of a summer looking at how to do this. In my view, going to the points made by councillors Ingham and Skinner, 
this is what should have been done this time last year. And it's a pity that they wasted a year. But we're here now, which is where we were meant to get. All of those threats that were banded around at strategic planning in July and at council in August, that we lose all information, we'd have to start again from scratch, are absolute nonsense. And they're proved in this report to be nonsense. As Councillor Bond has said, in fact, on the larger sites, she's quite right. It's highly unlikely anything else will come in. But this administration is particularly interested, of course, as well in the smaller sites, because we want small and medium enterprise businesses, builders, uh, those who are going to generate genuinely in the local economy, rather than just deliver profit to shareholders nationally. We want them to have a go as well. And if you can pick up new sites, 10, 20, 30 here and there, good. And that's why this local plan process needs to begin. Now, I, I was minded, Chen, as I said, I, you know, I so hope we don't have an hour of, uh, of violin playing over the guest and people trying to re-argue all this. It will be so boring. But what I was going to do, Chair, I was going to propose a recommendation of these on block. But I've heard what Councillor Rylance has said, and what I'd be really grateful for is advice from Ed um, or Shirley about how we can have a further discussion about options one and two and hybridising them a bit. And I, I don't know if this is what might be in Mike's mind as well, I'm not sure. Um, rather than just committing outright to option one now. I like option one because it's quick and we've got to get on with this, but I do take the point that Councillor Rylance has made. So I don't know if we, if we fudge that recommendation one today, is that a disaster? Uh, do we, you know, is there any harm in bringing that back, having asked Ed to look at one and two again and look at those timescales again? I don't know. I mean, I'll put that to you, Chair. And, and to it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arnold. Ed, I think that's a good time to bring you in. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean, so just to pick up on Councillor Rylance's point, um, there are no what I would call fallow months um, in, in option two timeline. What, what the um, sort of headings within that timeline are sort of points at which members would be engaged or consultation would be taking place. But there is a huge amount of work, shall we say back office work behind the scenes that officers would need to be doing uh, between those stages in order to undertake the work that's, that's listed earlier in the report um, in uh, section four, where we talk about undertaking the, the HELAR process, the sustainability appraisal, assessments under the habitat regulations, duty to cooperate work, viability work, etc. Um, and all the other evidence gathering and assimilation of that evidence that needs to take place. So we purposely not documented that in the timeline because uh, you know we, we could produce a 20 page report just um, detailing that and, and the work that needs to go on in terms of that. So I've purposely not gone into that level of detail and focused on um, the stages where consultation or reports would need to come through through this committee to, to progress things. Um, so I, I don't think there is any uh, slack in that timetable. We've deliberately tried to present two feasible options that are as, as quick as they can be given the uh, parameters of, of each of those options. Um, certainly if you want us to look at um, a hybrid type option I'm happy to take that away and and look at that but it would be good to understand what members would consider to be an appropriate level of engagement with them through that process um, and how many additional sort of workshops or perhaps meetings of, of the um, strategic planning committee would be needed during that timetable to then understand the workload that would be involved in supporting those events um, to, to make that happen and then revising the timetable accordingly. Um, so it'd be useful to have members steer on that, I think, um, in terms of what's expected. Uh, in, in terms of the consequences, as Councillor Arnott was raising, as sort of batting those, those, that decision in terms of options forward, um, I think the first stage of, of the production timelines is, is this issues and options report, which we are in the process of producing. 
um, and we can produce that and bring that to you in December and launch the consultation on that early next year, notwithstanding the, the timetable issues, I think. So uh, I don't think it's critical that that decision's made today um, in terms of which option. Um, but if you want us to go away and revisit that work, it, it would be good to have a better understanding as to, to what issues are of concern and, and the sort of levels of additional engagement over and above option one members would want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So moving on to Councillor Ingham. Thank you, Chair. Without any shadow of doubt, I've got to thank uh, Ed Freeman and his planning policy team for agreeing with the, the principle of a three uh, option, which I suggested to him uh, about a year ago. Um, it's important we crack on with this as quickly as possible, especially in light of having to uh, work to item three as well, uh, or recommendation three. Uh, that's why I would propose, you can't, I don't feel you can propose the recommendations on block because one, gives you a series of options. But what you can do is, uh, I, I propose we um, support recommendations two and three as printed, and recommendation one is changed to that members favor option one, and recommend to cabinet that the staffing budget for the uh, planning policy team, and et cetera, is increased. So that's what I propose, Chair. Thank you, Ben. Do I have a seconder for that? You do. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. So we'll move on to Councillor Hyle. It's going to be one of those days. I'm terribly sorry, gents and ladies. Um, I have multiple concerns, but starting with option one of the two selected, like others, I think we need to be very careful and mindful about the consultation we need to do. So I'm not in favour of option one. I'm in favour of option two for that reason. But with the staff power proposed in option one. And I still cannot understand why option two or one A wasn't proposed. The, the um, And I'm looking at Mr Freeman scratching his neck. Uh, with the extra staff members he's asking for for option one applied to option two, but still giving those consultative gaps one way and another, why the two don't get closer to each other, if you get my meaning, Mr. Freeman. Um, so I believe we need to be very careful about the public consultation. We also need to, at the same time, achieve this as quickly and as positively as possible. Um, but then comes the other thing. We've decided to leave GESP. I've got no arguments about that. I wasn't a fan of GESP, let's put it quite, quite clear. But at this minute in time, this is set up to look almost identical to guests. And then I do have a problem because it shouldn't and mustn't look like guests, otherwise you end up back where you were. And in particular, if I come to page 22 of the agenda, um, housing and land availability assessment. However, a lot on the second paragraph in the middle of it. However, a lot of site assessment work has already been undertaken through guests. Yeah, we know that. And the intent would be to build on this past evaluation. We shouldn't be building on the past evaluation. By all means, we need to look at it, use it and everything else. But we've got to be very careful what we're doing. Otherwise, you're going to be exactly the same place. Item B, the one directly after it, sustainability appraisal. Near the end, a scoping report sets out the picture of key matters that exist now. And the intent is that through plan appraisal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of our district is in AOMB. We know that, it's a reality. But also a lot of that district that is in AOMB has a housing demand that really should be accommodated close to where it's needed because there are families in Sidmouth and other places that wanna stay with their families in Sidmouth, but they cannot afford the Sidmouth prices. Now I'm not talking about a massive great 500 home development, although with the um, sea defences might be needed there, you might need that. But we do need to accommodate houses in our AOMB close to the communities where families are growing up and being and coming from and wish to stay with. 
just because they can't afford a two million pound house doesn't mean they should be moving elsewhere in the district or particularly to Exeter. We need to accommodate people close to where they are. And the third one, just as a, an, another example, assessment under habitat regulations. I've got a real issue with this because although it quite correctly identifies areas as special areas of conservation, Ramsar and all the other sites, it totally ignores what's further on our agenda, which is our Cliss Valley Park. Um, it doesn't mention that, doesn't mention where wildlife corridors are, doesn't mention species habitat mitigation that is needed because we have certain species in our area. I can think of a certain bat, I can think of various other animals that are really rare, but not in any of these designated areas, but need maintaining and looking after as well. So I have real doubts about how this is done and how this should be done but I'm not against the proposal as it stands with those amendments of putting the extra staff into the series two timetable and seeing where we are, unless I've got it totally wrong because Ed's looking quite confused, um, which isn't hard for me. But there are numerous other concerns I have throughout this document. We need to be really careful. I mean, I can remember a time when our last local plan was produced and near the end, we decided to take out areas that had a uh, neighborhood plan produced. Surely we should be doing the same here. Neighborhood plan is the lowest level of, um, or the lowest level we can have of um, local democracy. People are voting in their local communities to say what they want and how they want it. And, you know, quite honestly, if they've done a neighborhood plan in the last two or three years, that should be upheld and supported and we shouldn't be looking in those areas. Um, as you get closer to the five-year break, and quite rightly, that's the five-year break, the neighbourhood plan has less relevance. But at the same time, we should be heeding these areas and the local democracy that caused them. So that's just a few views for me at this minute in time, but I, I am against the wholesale adoption of just scheme one. As much as I like the time frame, we need more consultation, I'm afraid. Thanks very much, Mike. So move from one mic to the other, uh, Councillor Mike Allen. Thank you, Dan. Um, it strikes me that if you look at the uh, review that uh, Ed Freeman put together of the planning, uh, uh, the PAS toolkit, that there's a large chunk of uh, the plan that doesn't need further work. What I do not understand is considering that so much work has been put into uh, defining uh, a whole range of things to do with spatial planning, uh, West End master plan, the Axminster master plan, neighbourhood development plans and on we go. There's so much of that work that ought to be simply consolidated and put into the local plan, including the updates that um, Ed Freeman has noted. So I don't see why it has to go right the way back to issues and options and the whole standard process, because that just means we're back in developing uh, a, a total local plan instead of a revision to the plan. So I think that the best thing to do is to look a very hard look at the scope that we're defining for this particular local plan review. And with the best will in the world, if you want to sell something, you present two options with one that's expensive and looks more difficult. And I can see very much that uh, we presented with two options when actually we need a hybrid option exactly as Eleanor Rylance has explained exactly as Mike Howe has explained we do need a proper review done of the local plan not a brand new one and I'm not happy with the present proposal because it doesn't actually do anything more and cost us a lot more, end up with a lot more work that we've already done and frankly we don't need to do all this. 
the, the, the PAS review shows quite clearly there are certain things we need to do. Those should be done. And what I'd love to see is Karen Simpkin getting her hands on the planning process and actually doing a proper systems review to really get the thing motoring. We can't keep going around the same loops all the time. And above all, we must involve local people. The neighbourhood development plans took a tremendous amount of work, cost, and should be the building blocks of any revision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Ed, I think that's a good time to bring you in again, just to answer all the questions. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, yeah, so uh, if we just wind back a couple of speakers, um, in, in terms of options, obviously we could come up with a hybrid option, which is effectively the, the resources proposed under option one with the levels of engagement shown on, under option two, which I think that a couple of speakers have, have suggested would be their favoured approach. Um, all I would say is I don't think it leaves you as a, at a position of being able to do it for the timetable shown under option two. Um, sorry, do an option two under the timescale for option one. It would probably be a hybrid in terms of timelines because the additional resources speeds up certain tasks such as um, officer uh, summarising consultation responses, for example, and producing uh, reports and producing evidence documents. But other areas of that timetable, like the engagement itself, um, obviously the additional resources only have a limited impact on. So, um, but happy if members want to, um, you know, resolve a hybrid approach like that, and then we can produce uh, a timetable uh, that, that reflects that, that approach with the resources in one and the engagement in option two. Um, so happy to do that. Um, in terms of Mike Howe's comments, in terms of the various stages of work, it, it, I think the report is, well, tries to be clear at, at uh, paragraph 4.1 that those stages of work are not definitive. There are clearly other things that we would need to do, um, uh, of, of which Mike highlighted an, a number of them. Um, and, and obviously we will need to do that work as well. Um, what it's highlighting are, are key kind of legal obligations that we would need to undertake in order for the plan to be sound. But there are other areas of work that we would also need to do. Um, I hear what's been said in terms of neighbourhood plans, and obviously we shouldn't, um, we need to have regard to those neighbourhood plans in production of the local plan. Um, however, we do need to bear in mind that local plans take the lead and neighbourhood plans have to be in compliance with the local plan, not the other way around. Um, and so while it might not be members will to go and do something that might be contrary to a neighbourhood plan, we do need to um, be aware that legally we have that option. And, and so for the plan to be found sound, we need to consider all of those options, even if they aren't the favoured approach ultimately. Um, in terms of uh, comments Mike Allen was making, um, I, I think whether you term this as a review of the existing local plan or a new local plan, it, it fundamentally in terms of the process we have to go through in government guidance, it amounts to the same thing. Um, and we do have to go through the process of consultation and engagements that's outlined in the uh, legislation. Um, and we do need to review all of the evidence and the documents. A lot of the evidence produced under the old local plan is is quite old now. We have got a lot of that work done as the evidence for guests, but we need to pick through that and disentangle these Devon parts from the wider guest work and see where additional evidence is needed um, and go through that process. So I think it ultimately amounts to the same thing and the amount, the same work as detailed in this report, whichever way you look at this. Um, and obviously, you know, we haven't padded this out or put in any, any unnecessary work. This is what is in the report is what we believe is necessary in order to produce the local plan and for that to be found sound, hopefully through examination at the end of the process. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. So we'll carry on with Councillor Skinner. Go ahead, Phil. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and actually, um, uh, Mr. Freeman has um, yeah, really circumvented some of the questions uh, 
that I was going to ask. But I think there's one thing uh, I, I do need to get out, and that is uh, uh, Councillor Armot, who continually comes back when people have had their say, and then he comes back with his bit. Nobody ever suggested, Councillor Armot, that the, all the information would be lost if we pulled out of gas. That's just fake news. And again, a suggestion that members don't feel, don't go back and we talk about gas is you consider it to be boring, uh, boring um, as a sort of a suggestion of gagging in the name of openness and transparency, I guess. You're continually saying this about what members probably shouldn't say. I think uh, in the openness of democracy, other people can say exactly what they like. But as far as um, uh, moving on with the agenda and as far as what Mr. Freeman has just said, and absolutely are we in a place where it seems to be that uh, we're in caught between a hard place and a rock regarding pulling out a gas and yet having to move with speed. And I think Councillor Rylance does make a, a good point and has been made, I think, by uh, um, uh, Councillor Howe, that there is, the, there is the moving on with speed at the same time, just ensuring that what we are doing with the speed is we're getting things right. So there's that balance to be had. So I'm tending to think, uh, and I might, if I, if I may through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, have a su suggest to Councillor Ingham that the suggestion of having this hybrid high profile having a look at what and now listening to what some of the comments others have made is pulled back from the seconding of the three recommendations that put forward because I think there's a way that we can actually word this in a better way and in agreement with what what um, Mr. Freeman is suggesting, and I think the things he suggested and, and has put in about pulling that information and that evidence forward, that I, I actually think we could get ourselves into really quite a good place if we can get this uh, methodology correct about going forward, because there is the need of the speed. We do need to get things uh, absolutely right. We can't keep talking and talking and talking and asking the public where what they think about everything everywhere, because at the end of the day, what we'll end up with will be slippage. So there's that balance between public uh, um, having their engagement, which we've done a fair bit of that anyway, but the public having their engagement, the neighborhood plans. And so there's quite a little bit to do to just to garner, to get these things together. And I think we need to sort of tease that out and get ourselves into a good place. So I think I'm going to pull back from seconding Councillor Ingham. I don't want to upset Councillor Ingham because I do dislike it if somebody seconds me and then decides to pull out. But I, if Councillor Ingham, if he could come back, if you don't mind, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just to see that I do think there's that discussion to be had about just how we just configure the three recommendations to slightly change them a bit to get us into a bit of a better placing moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Um, Councillor Ian, would you like to change your proposal at all in light of what Councillor Skinner's just said? Uh, uh, sure, uh, we, we can do that, Chairman. Uh, and we change that to uh, do a review uh, for, for a hybrid between option one and two. Um, but that doesn't mean to say we choose a hybrid between one and two. Because can I remind uh, uh, members that we have a national government that has a, a, a strategy of build, build, build. And we, if we don't get this local plan in place quick enough, uh, they'll force us to build, build, build. Yeah. And can I warn those members that represent Broadclist, Cliff St. Mary, Wimple, Aylesbeer, West Hill, and Rockbeer, guess where they're going to be building first? Because if, if sites have already been identified as potential, you know, uh, um, as was through GESP, then if you don't have a local plan, if you don't have GESP, that's where it will happen. And they'll get permission sooner than everyone else. So though I'm happy to change recommendation one, I still think you'd be well advised to be ready to adopt option one. Um, in order to counter any uh, fast track pressure from national government to build within East Devon, uh, because it is the, the West End that will suffer immediately, especially where sites have already been suggested by uh, landowners. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Catherine. So just to clarify on your proposal, you proposed to um, Scope yes. out a hybrid option. Consider it. Uh, that to come back to the next meeting, but 
Okay. And that's, yep, that, that's right. It's going to be as quick as possible, Chairman. Fantastic. Councillor Skinner, are you okay to second that? Well, I, I am, Mr. Chairman, but I, I just wondered, I just wonder if there is the time today that whether other members, we're sort of, we're, this is what's really good about this the strategic planning meeting is, is that we are, you start off in one place and other people put their ideas in, you brainstorm these things through and you get to a better place. And that's surely what the democracy and what we're all about, what we're trying to do here. So I'm happy to let it go to another meeting, but I don't want to lose any time. I would, I would, if I had Ed Freeman next to me, I would be asking him, you know, where's the urgency, Ed? Did we ought to be do, doing this to get into a good place? At the same time, I don't want to rush it and get it all, get anything wrong either. And if, if I think if, if I could put the question then, Mr. Chairman, through you, if I could put the question to Mr. Freeman that if members, if we don't garner a form of words here today, in which is a recommendation that goes forward and it waits until then, I was going to say the next meeting, but the next meeting's Thursday, you know, I didn't really mean that one, to be honest, but I mean, if you wanted to pull something to that, that's fine. Um, but a form of words that takes us into a, a, a way of moving forward quite cohesively and with a little bit of speed. If Mr. Freeman, what, could he give us a bit of guidance on, does he really want something done here today? Would he prefer or or have we got time to, to sort of sort this out come the next meeting? That's what I really want to know, Mr. Chairman. Officers always want clarity. Um, Ed, do you want to answer that? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, oh, I'd love clarity. Um, I, I, I think um, to, to answer Councillor Sinner's question, I don't think it's going to cause immediate delays by um, spending some time looking at a hybrid option because we are already preparing um, the issues and options consultation report and we're on time to bring that to you at the December meeting which is the next scheduled meeting after this week um, and was intending to bring a new local development scheme to that meeting as well which would have firmed up and formally adopted the timetable. Um, so what we can do is um, work up a hybrid option which from my understanding and appreciate confirmation of this is effectively the resources proposed under option one with the engagement proposed under option two um, so working on that approach we can quickly work up um, a revised timetable and bring that to the december meeting alongside the new local development scheme incorporating that for members to agree hopefully at, at, at that meeting um, and if, if, if that's what members are happy with I'm happy to go and work on on that with confidence that that's that's the direction of travel thank you thank you Ed. so on that on that Mr Chairman I'll say that I'll second Councillor Ingham in his view because you need that from me as to whether he's got a second or not yeah thank you Councillor Skinner so we move on Councillor Davey go ahead You got round to me already. Oh, it's okay. Um, I, I think it feels as though we, we are looking at a straight choice between consultation and speed here. And I'm always a bit wary of um, dichotomies like that. Um, so I think we can have terrific community engagement and still work quite quickly. Um, I'm not sure that, I, you know, I find if you're scheduling a meeting, uh, and you throw out some dates to people, they either respond in the first three days or they don't respond at all. Um, and, and I think community engagement could be like that. If people know that you are asking them the right questions in the right way, then they will engage. Um, and I think sometimes it's, it's more a question of how we get community engagement and how we listen to the results rather than um, necessarily needing to allow three months for community engagement. And I think we are in a new world here. Who'd have thought at the beginning of this year that by the middle of the year, we'd all be meeting electronically. And, uh, uh, you know, things have moved forward very fast. And I think we should be using um, electronic means uh, for people to comment on planning applications, uh, on, um, on, on planning matters as well. Um, and I think we could do some very effective online engagement um, 
as well as um, or possibly replacing. I mean, as, as Ed says at the moment, um, face to face workshops and, and exhibitions are not an option, but we can do a lot of these things virtually. Um, so I my favor is is for uh, time scale one um, and um, and still keep that level of public engagement in there, just intensify it. Um, uh, the GASP uh, did identify some good things. Um, we have got uh, a number of sites identified through that. Um, and it also identified some very good aspirations. Of course, part of my concern was they were only aspirations uh, for high quality, well insulated homes. And I think there's a lot of stuff we could lift out of there. Um, but really give it some teeth rather than just make it aspirations. There were some good uh, ideas about employment as well and infrastructure, particularly electronic infrastructure. Um, and I would also like to see our plan, um, although I'm preempting things a bit here, but look uh, at more green infrastructure to assist the move to sustainable communities. And I go back to something Councillor Howe said um, about people being able to stay in, in the villages and small settlements uh, that they want to live in. And I think maybe the plan is unduly restrictive there sometimes, uh, our current plan. Um, and actually, I would favour allowing villages to expand uh, in small ways. Um, you know, we don't want massive housing estates on the edge of small villages, but I think um, there are ways that, that we can have sensitive development within the AONB. Um, so I will uh, stop there, um, but I certainly favour getting on with this with all possible speed, but also with the maximum amount of engagement. Thank you, Councillor Davy. Uh, we'll move on, Councillor Hayward. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, um, having listened to all the, the speakers, um, and we always find ourselves in this bizarre situation that those who don't often see much synergy between ourselves actually find some common ground. Um, I do favour, uh, personally, the hybrid option. Um, engagement is essential. We must engage with the public. One of the biggest criticisms up till now has been that this council hasn't engaged or it's done things behind the scenes or behind closed doors. So we must be open and transparent. And on that, Councillor Skinner and I agree entirely. Um, with regards to neighbourhood plans, I sympathise with all the communities and towns and villages that have gone through the, uh, the huge effort to get their plan in place. But in all fairness, they all knew that were the local plan to change, they would have to amend too, because the neighbourhood plans are subservient to the local plan. They must be compliant. They can't go above and beyond it. So if the local plan changes, and they all knew it was a five-year process, certainly the communities that I've worked with, that ultimately at some point there would be a need for a revision, another set of steering groups. So I don't think we can, we can be mindful of everything that those neighbourhood plans have, have put forward and indeed there's lots of communities who find the local plan very very lacking and wish to put things forward and I really encourage them to engage with us and it may well be that the local plan doesn't change in certain areas and, and aspects of the neighbourhood plan can carry on but I think they will need to be adapted too. Um, in terms of that hybrid option, it's a pity. I don't believe that uh, Mr. Davey and Councillor Rowland are here with us. Uh, if they are, my apologies. But obviously there are purse keepers, so there will be financial implications. But essentially, for all the things that Strategic plan uh, Planning Committee considers, um, you know, the coastal management, uh, heritage, everything, nothing is going to be as important as this. This is the future of East Devon and the decisions that we uh, put forward to cabinet, to council to adopt are going to affect residents for decades to come. So if it needs, needs more meetings of strategic planning, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, Chair, um, then that's what we'll need to do. If they need to be longer, that's what they'll need to do. And if councillors find that difficult or find it wearing, it may well be that other councillors will have to uh, take over. But you know, the, the, the heavy lifting is going to come down to strategic planning committee. Um, and so we need to all be ready for that because this needs to be 
taken to the very end and taken out. Um, all of us, as we travel around the district, we see developments that crept through uh, due to the lack of a five year land, uh, housing land supply. And some of them are not pleasant. Some of them are inherently in the wrong place and none of us want to be in that situation again. So again, that gives us uh, power to our elbows uh, to get this thing over the line as quickly as we possibly can, but with all due diligence and consultation. And my final comment, Chair, is that for those who have seen the film Apollo 13 and the point where they're trying to work out how to bring that ship home, you have an army of people working out where you can save a few pounds here and a few minutes there. Well, that's the hybrid situation. It may need more resourcing. That's a financial issue. It may need, uh, to take Councillor Rylance's point, some integration and doing some things consecutively instead of doing them concurrently. And I appreciate what Ed said, is that there's work to be done. There always is. But we must make every minute count in this process. There must not be a minute, an hour, a day that's not being used productively. So if we can shrink, let's say option two, between option one and find a middle ground and bring it near option one, then we must do that. We must all work hard. We must all work together for the common good of East Devon. Um, and a lot of the things that have happened in the past need to be put to one side. They really do. Because every resident of East Devon is looking at us uh, expectantly uh, to deliver for them. Uh, and if we don't, we'll all be held accountable. And I, I'm very confident that as a committee and as a council, we can take this forward. Uh, for the for the greater good of this district. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hayward. Um, I know we're coming up to two hours, so I think uh, um, at four o'clock we will have a comfort break. So if we could just wind up the last few speakers on this and then we'll stop for a short break. So Councillor Andrew Moulding. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, and I must say I agree entirely with Councillor Benningham that we have to get on with this. If we don't get on with it, we shall finish up with development where we don't want it. And therefore there is no, no question that we have to get on and do this. Now I've heard about hybrids and so on. Now if the hybrid just means that we need to include more engagement then as Cancer Ollie Davy said, there is no need for engagement to take up months of time, I notice on the uh, table on page 28 that highlighted in yellow are all the consultations and there are the same number of consultations in option one as in option two. The only real variation is building in a time period for engagement work. Councillor Davy, as I said, is absolutely right. That doesn't need to take a great deal of time. So therefore, my view is, yes, if it's called a hybrid and that hybrid means that we're building in some engagement time, let's do it. But it doesn't need to take an extra year because that's the difference between option one and option two, an extra year. And we do need to get on with delivering an up to date local plan. Something I wanted to ask uh, uh, Ed Freeman, which was mentioned earlier, and that's regarding the HELA. And mentioned by Councillor Arnott was that we want to make sure that we bring forward sites for SMEs, self-build, local builders. Yes, we do. But I don't see that normally as being uh, able to be done through the HELA process. Normally, if I remember, and this is where I want to ask the question of Ed Freeman, the HELA usually is to identify sites of a minimum size. Now, are we reducing that minimum size to enable SMEs and self-builders and local builders to bring forward sites where they could put 20 homes or 50 homes? Because I don't know if, if I'm right, but Gila was anything up to about three or 400 homes plus. The small sites weren't identified by the Gila process. And certainly if you're gonna reduce the Gila for those very small sites, 20 homes or whatever, it's going to take a lot more time, which I'm sure we don't have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moulding. Um, if we go to Councillor Blakey next. 
Thank you, Chairman. I shall be very brief. Um, my first instinct was to say that option one is the, the, the way to go, because I would always like to see things done sooner rather than later. But listening to the arguments about a uh, hybrid, I think some very valid points have been made in, in the, uh, a little bit of extra time to enable the job to be done more carefully is probably a good thing. And as, a, as Councillor Moulding has pointed out, the difference in time frame between option one, option two is, is just under a year. Um, so it seems to me that, a, that, that um, a hybrid is a sensible approach. And if we can reduce that difference in time frame from almost a year to less than half a year, um, I would suggest that that really is not an awful big difference. And um, one of the things that I think we should be including within the assessment is where we're talking about additional staffing, the recruitment of um, and option one, two additional planning officers, uh, bearing in mind that I don't think we found the magic money tree yet. Perhaps one of the options we should be looking at is just recruiting one additional officer, not two. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bakey. So we've gone round the committee now. It's, it's going back to people that want to chime in for a second, uh, second bite of the cherry. So if we just keep this down to as, as minimum as possible. So, Councillor Arnott. Thank you, Chair. Um, to assist our imminent comfort break, I'd just like to uh, move to a recommendation, if possible, that um, on number one, that we simply cut that down, that we recommend to Cabinet that the staffing budget for the planning policy team be increased to enable the recruitment of two additional planning officers. As, as is effectively, but we haven't chosen an option. Uh, we put in a second, or let's put in a fourth or second, whichever way you want to do it, which is that um, we call for a further report on timescales and that we make a decision on this at the next strategic planning meeting and then that the other ones are left as they are currently uh, chair that, that that would be my proposal and I'm not sure we've got a proposal on the table at the moment so because I, th I think the option one one's been withdrawn I hope that's no, you've got one we do, have, got one. we do have one already but it's Shirley would you class that as a material change or enough for an amendment and should we be asking Councillor Arnott, uh, Councillor Ingham, if he accepts Paul Arnott's uh, amendment, or it, should we be taking them as two separate proposals? Um, I think perhaps the cleanest would be to ask Councillor Ingham if he would accept Councillor Arnott's suggestion at this point, and whether Councillor Skinner also accepts that, as we do have a motion on the table. Um, but both um, Councillor Ingham and Councillor Arnott mentioned the next Strategic Planning Committee, which, as you know, is the day after tomorrow. Yeah. And Ed Freeman did mention that that might be a bit tight and possibly yeah. it would be the December, if, if we could have clarity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, if, if mine is an amendment and if, if Ben and Philip were happy to accept it, then of course it would be uh, the report would come to the December meeting, Chair. Councillor Ingham, are you happy to accept that? Phil, are you happy? Um, uh, could I, could, what, what was option four that you said, Councillor Arnott? Could you just repeat that one for me? What The, the, the one that you wanted to add in, call it four for argument's yeah, sake. Yeah, for si simply that uh, we call for a further report on the timescales to be discussed at the December strategic planning meeting. That's all it is. Mm. Okay, okay. I, I think, if Ben, if you're, if you're happy, I'll, I'll, I'll go along with that, that's, that's fine. That, yeah. Yes, it, thank you, Phil. Chair, I, I'm happy to change that, but we must bear in mind, two months is two months. Yes, and it is. You, you keep adding these up and the yep. difference between option one and option two is only a year. How long does it take you yep. to approve an extra 750 houses? It doesn't take you six months. So we really have to crack on with this. Thank you, Chair. So, Councillor Rylance, can we keep it down to 30 seconds and then we'll move to the vote and then we can get off to the comfort break quickly. I want to finish this item. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, Councillor Arnott kind of preempted what I was going to say. I just wanted to um, 
basically what I want is option option two, but on option one's timeline. I mean, that's that would be my ideal thing. I can see Ed looking slightly wry now. <laughs> I mean, you, you can probably imagine that's what I want. But if we could get as close to option one's timeline with the level of consultation of option two, I'd be happy. So what I'd really like, I mean, I see that the uh, issues and options report can go ahead in either option. It's, it's pretty much identical in terms of the timing. What I would like to suggest is that we actually kickstart the, the, the first part of the process, the issues and options report now pending ed's revised timeline and you know wherever you can make efficiency savings we need this council's best brains in terms of efficiency and time in motion to work out where we can where we can introduce efficiency savings um i support the, the i support the recommendation to resource this effectively and to add two staff members because there's no point doing a half a, a half committed job to it if we're going to do this fast we need to do it well and we need to do we need to have the staffing for it <clears throat> and I think ultimately uh, the best option would be two staff members rather than getting in consult consultants as and when. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I trust I trust the planning department to know better than I do where they can where they can make uh, time savings. Um, but I would really would like to see Ed and his team working on producing a very expedited timeline, which in, in, in incorporates as much consultation as is possible. Um, and in, with that in mind, I think I, I, I support what councillor are not suggested just now and I'm not sure whether I'm suggesting something else I don't think I am and that you know that's that I think that's all I had to say really. Thank you councillor Rylands. Councillor Howell 30 seconds go ahead. It will be longer than that but nevertheless I, I'm nervous about the proposal as it stands I support the extra officers um, and in fact what uh, councillor Rylands has just said is what I believe is the right way forward um, there are long gaps in 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 item two um, of consultation. Um, I don't believe we need. I'm looking at one. Looks like almost twelve weeks of consultation. I don't believe we need such long times. I think we need to cut the have the consultations, but cut them shorter. What Councillor Davy was saying earlier, um, you know, down to five or four weeks would be adequate time to keep all the consultations there. I would like to see us going forward with a resolution today that told planning they could go and start recruiting two more officers. Because if we don't do it until December, and then you start advertising, you do interviews, you do everything else, we're looking at middle of next year before you get anywhere. So subject to finance being available, that needs to be clarified as a matter of urgency that we are supporting the approval of two more officers. Um, so I wish somehow, those with much better brains than me can mo put that into the motion. And for the life of us, we are in a virtual world these days. I don't see why this has to wait until December. Surely we can have a quick 30 minute discussion in November as a strategic planning, just to say yes or no to Mr. Freeman's proposals. I hope four weeks we should be enough for him. He's usually fairly quick, certainly what he's done over the last four or eight weeks. So I wish both those timescales to be amended particularly the instruction that we want to find two officers start advertising tomorrow virtually if you get my meaning subject to other departments getting their way sorry thanks very much councillor um councillor allen we'll yeah, go to to pick, pick up the same theme i think that uh, recommendation one as it uh, <laughs> stands, should include the recommendation to cabinet about the staffing budget but secondly, I think we need to realise the implications of having an out of time plan and that I would like to see when next um, uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, Ed Freeman comes back. The first thing we ought to see is an issue and options report. And uh, according to the time scale he's got, I see no reason why it shouldn't be either December or January that that issues and options report is placed before our committee. And uh, that, as a starting point, ought to have a go ahead today. So I'm adding um, a, a point to the recommendations as, a, as a, an amendment that we approve that uh, um, the committee uh, Sorry, the committee approves that um, planning undertakes and issues an option report 
with all speed for um, delivery December 20th. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. I think I keep seeing hands go up, so I think it's time that we have a comfort break now and then we'll we'll bring we'll come back to this. I was hoping to draw the, the item to an end, but it doesn't seem like that's gonna happen. So if we just have a five minute comfort break now and then we'll come back to it, finish the item off. Thank you. I'll leave the live stream on. So if everyone can just mute and shut down their cameras, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks all.
Right, are we all ready to start again? So thanks all for waiting. Um, if we go back. If we go back to Councillor Howes uh, wanted some clarification on the proposal that um, two members of staff were re recruited as a matter of urgency rather than waiting until the December meeting. Um, Councillor Ingham, are you happy to accept that and that that's what your proposal was just to clarify that? happy to accept that two people are recruited immediately yeah so we don't wait until the december meeting to then start recruiting well that's for cabinet isn't it to decide that yeah that, that's yeah. just what i was going to advise chair it would need to us. be a staffing uh, budget to be recommended to cabinet for the two uh, additional planning officers is the uh, recommendation that i had drafted in light of members uh, discussions. I don't know if that is accepted by um, Councillor Ingham and Councillor Skinner. Yeah, that's okay. Fantastic. Be, Mr Chair, could it be raised as a matter of urgency on Cabinet next week or whatever it is? You can ask the leaders in the room, you can ask him yourself. Exactly. That's why yeah, I want no. Th th thank you. Thank you for those clarifications, Dan, as well, because I, I, was, I was concerned that I didn't think um, I, th I thought I was worried that Mike had thought that the, that the first uh, recommendation had gone, which was to get the officers, which we clearly need to do as fast as possible. I just wonder whether it might be helpful if what we do, Chair, is um, get this confirmed in Cabinet in the first week in December. But in order to do that, and surely may be able to help us here, that we, we would have to have um, this work on the timescales done by second or third week of December so that we could, as a strategic planning committee, just meet again. So we settle this issue. That then comes to Cabinet. And at that point, it's, it's um, all systems are go. The Strategic Planning Committee for December, I have for the 15th. So um, draft, draft uh, agenda reports would need to be put up fairly swiftly for the end of November, beginning of December. Oh, sorry, what I was suggesting was that worse than that, that we actually have a special Strategic Planning Committee meeting if these hybrid timings are of an issue. In, in November, a single item, a uh, single agenda item meeting of strategic planning, that would be then in good time to come to Cabinet at the beginning of December. Um, I, it, would, it would have to be discussed with the Chairman and Democratic Services to how we can, we can slot it in. I couldn't give a definitive approval or, or yes, no answer to that, I'm afraid, Councillor or not at this point. Okay. Chair, could I, could I just um, butt in if that's okay? Any time, Mark. <laughs> Don't say it quite like that. <laughs> um, as I understand matters, the committee is agreed on the fact that um, they do want to see us get on with the local plan. And you can see that in recommendation two on the paper, which is endorse the production of a local plan issues and options report so that's that's something that you all want to get on with and we can get on with irrespective of the staffing issue uh, similarly as I understand it there's no objection to recommendation three as it is on the order paper um, the 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 issue of additional staffing is something that ultimately is a council matter because it's an an, ex, in, uh, an addition to the budget so that can be approved if you're so minded, but it will still have to go through a bit of a process. So the only real sticking issue I'd understand it is the formal timetable you want to work to about whether it's option one, option two, or a hybrid. You know, we can bring that back to you um, uh, in, in the December um, meeting 
it won't delay any work that can be done um, as of now, if you like. So uh, all it's going to impact upon is sort of work in the new year, uh, but we'll have kicked off everything we can kick off this year, if you like. So um, uh, I don't know that you need to worry unduly about whether it needs a, a special meeting or not special meeting. All that can be resolved without any loss of timetabling um, in December, because we can just get on with the first stage, which is the issues and options report fundamentally. Thanks, Mark. I think that's really helpful. Um, I think the last thing before we went for the break was Councillor Allen proposed an amendment uh, for Councillor Ingham and Councillor Skinner to accept. Councillor Allen, can you just repeat what the amendment was? Just for clarification, uh, it's really around point two uh, and, and basically is to say, yes, we want an issue and options report to come back to the committee in December 2020. I didn't want any delay uh, in terms of the staffing issues to get in the way of that particular recommendation. So uh, assuming that, that uh, that's acceptable, recommendation two remains as it stands. Fantastic, okay. So, so think... just to confirm for that chairman, we don't need the additional staff to get on with the options, the issues and options report. That's programmed, that's in the work stream, and it will come through for your due consideration. The issue of the extra resources comes into play next year, if you like, depending on how much consultation we want to do and the speed at which we wish to do it fundamentally. Fantastic. I think we've We've added everything on this agenda right and I think it is time to take it to a vote now. So Shirley, can you just confirm what uh, members will be voting for and we'll take it to a vote. Thank you, Chair. Um, so recommendation one has been revised so that um, on the last latest uh, motion by Councillor Ingham and Councillor Skinner that it is recommended to Cabinet a staffing budget for two additional planning officers. The um, be produced. Um, recommendation two, members endorse production of a local plan issues and options report to come back to committee in December 2020 with a view to consultation starting in January 21. Um, recommendation three, members recommend that cabinet support in principle the production of a non statutory plan to include a joint strategy and infrastructure plan for the greater Exeter area in partnership with Exeter, Mid Devon, Teambridge and Devon County Councils, subject to agreement of details of the scope of the plan, a timetable for its production, the resources required, governance arrangements, etc. And then a further recommendation that a further report on timescales be brought back to the December Strategic Planning Committee. If members please would indicate with a yes button if they're in support of those motions, press your no button if you're against the motions, and please raise your blue hand to indicate you are abstaining from the vote. So for the benefit of those watching us online, the vote is now taking place. And almost there, Chair. And that is carried, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you both. So we'll move on to agenda item number nine, the future housing needs in East Devon. It's page 34 on your agendas. Ed Freeman again to present a report. You're a one man show today, Ed. <laughs> one man band. Um, thank you, Chairman. So uh, this report relates to a study commissioned last year to assess the housing needs of the district. Um, it's considered to be a vital piece of work that should help to inform production of the next local plan. Um, the work highlights a number of key needs in the district over the next 20 years. I um, don't propose to, to go through them in my presentation, but they are listed in paragraph 2.2 in the covering report and obviously in much more detail in the main report, which is appended. Um, you'll note that a final version of that report has gone online in the last few days. Um, there were a few updates added to that, um, just to take account of proposed changes that the government are consulting on that members will be aware of in terms of the standard method for calculating housing need and um, the implications of that, uh, just to ensure the report is bang up to date. 
Um, so the purpose of bringing the report to you today is to draw your attention to this important piece of work um, and its importance to informing future debate and discussions through the local plan preparation process. So um, I wasn't envisaging necessarily a detailed discussion of the findings today. Obviously, there will be opportunities as we go through production of the local plan and the issues that it raises um, come in through that process to, to pick up those issues for discussion. So uh, it was simply to draw it to members' attention today and ask for members to note the report and agree to it forming part of the evidence base for the new local plan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, going outside of the committee first, if we go to Councillor Paul Miller. Thank you. Um, I'd like, if I may, to draw the committee's attention to the statement on paragraph 2.2D of this report, page 36 of your agenda. Um, this refers to the consultant's estimate that we require an average of 461 affordable homes per year between 2020 and 2040. My question to Mr. Freeman um, is, did the consultation break this down? Because there are various types of affordable housing. Um, as Mr. Freeman will, will no doubt appreciate, um, those include different price ranges within the affordable housing framework in what registered providers are allowed to offer. So, um, Let's take a quarter two of the financial year of the completed affordable housing um, in the district, um, of which in quarter two we had 40, 40 completed affordable housing. Uh, 23 uh, were about 80% of market rent, which I tend to refer to as so-called affordable housing because um, it's not affordable for all incomes. 11 was shared ownership and uh, only six was, was social rent. So I consider that actually, if you're able to break it down, it really matters. And I was unable to, to see in the, in the consultant report whether they were able to break this down because it's, um, you know, it's all, all good and well saying 461 affordable homes, but within that, there are various different price ranges. There's one final question I wanted to ask, which was um, the statement um, in that same paragraph, which says, though this, this figure needs to be seen within the context of many households in housing need, living in what may be adequate private sector rented housing and being in receipt of housing benefit. I'm just a bit confused by that statement because you're either in, you're either in housing need or you're not. Um, so I'm just a little bit confused about that, but maybe Mr. Freeman could elucidate it further. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Miller. We'll go to Councillor Rickson first and then go over to Ed. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've got three areas I would like to comment on. First is the housing need consultants report. I'm looking at item 2.2 as well. Item H says satisfaction levels for new build homes are lower in Cranbrook than elsewhere. Why is this? Item I, it says 19% moved to East Devon from other districts outside Exeter and Devon. So this means that one in five homes from 2020 to 2040 will not be for our own population. So of the um, 11,239 dwellings uh, mentioned in this, uh, this part of the report, that means that 2,135 are being built for the rest of the UK. Now we have a duty to cooperate with DCC and Devon, but are we obliged to build houses for the rest of the UK? I'll point out that already Sidmouth has 40% of retirees We've got two major projects in the pipeline and building even more in the Sid Valley would be unsustainable long term because homes are not being built for the working population. Also, we're storing up trouble for the future because of the additional cost and pressure this places on the health service, as reported in Devon Live on the 19th of September 2019. The report listed seven challenges facing healthcare services. I would also suggest we should take note of the main report of the Poverty Working Panel. Item 4.2 stated that 42% of housing benefit claims are in the private rented sector and 55% of discretionary housing payments are awarded to those in the private rented sector. Item 6.2, 72% of housing benefit claim, claimants under the LHA scheme have rent higher than the LHA rate. And because of high rents and wages and low wages, this means that the council is propping up the private sector via payments to private landlords. This together with point 2.2B of the um, report we're looking at on house prices and income surely proves the case 
for East Devon to provide more social housing and or shared ownership housing. The last point is about second home ownership. Press reports state that one in, two home, one in 10 homes are now owned by people with more than one home. Well, A, this is unsustainable long term, and it means that if this increases even further, East Devon will end up spending higher and higher amounts on HB and DH payments. Also, there's a percentage, point number B, there is also a percentage of second home owners who game the system by claiming their homes are a business, which allegedly fails to make any profit, thereby ensuring they pay neither council tax nor business rates. Well, words fail me on this one. And the problem is that second home ownership could increase even further with the impact of CV19 and more people looking at staycationing. How much money do we as a council lose as a result of this? And so are unable to provide um, you know, the services we would like. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rickson. So, Ed, if we go back to you, just to answer the questions. To answer Paul Miller's question, I believe it's figure six gives the breakdown in the in the full report. Yes, Chairman, that's correct. So if you go to the, the main reports, that's, um, there's a hyperlink under the background papers. On page 11, figure six uh, gives a detailed breakdown of um, the needs, um, both in terms of uh, type of affordable housing, but also the size of properties, so one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four plus, uh, both as total numbers and percentages. So hopefully that provides Councillor Miller with the information he was looking for there. Um, in terms of the point that he raised also, I think in terms of point D where um, in paragraph 2.2 .2 in the report where it says um, the figure needs to be seen in the context of many households in housing need living in what may be adequate private sector rented housing and being received for housing benefits. Apologies, you're, you're right, that's not, not clear. Um, basically, what it's trying to say is that there are a number of households um, in that situation who aspire to home ownership and therefore would, in addition to the 461 affordable homes, lead to a potentially additional need of affordable homes for ownership. Um, so, therefore, there's, um, that figure is potentially worse than 461, uh, but it's obviously quite hard to quantify that. All right, thanks, Ed. That's really good. Thank you. With regard to um, the further questions, I had uh, a note about why satisfaction levels are lower in Cranbrook. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I was looking through the report trying to see if there's any more detail on, on that. Um, I haven't found that point yet. Um, I think generally satisfaction levels have been uh, recently high, even in Cranbrook from the Cranbrook resident surveys that have been done. Um, but obviously there are always um, snagging issues quite often with, with new properties. And I know we did have some issues at Cranbrook with the affordable by design properties, which were um, required under the original section 106 agreement, which generally meant we were getting affordable homes that were just smaller than they should be. Um, so it may be that that's impacted on, on that. And we've since negotiated away the affordable by design properties because of the problems that they were causing in, in lieu of other um, types of, of affordable housing. So that may have had an impact, but I'm slightly speculating in that I can't lay my hands on the information, but it, it may be that there's more detail on that in, in the main body of the report, but at 127 pages, I can't lay my hands on the, the specific reference. Um, with regard to the one in five homes that would not be for the resident population of East Devon, I mean, th those would be for people wishing to migrate into East Devon fundamentally from outside of the district. And yes, under the government guidance, we are required to meet those needs as well. They are a constituent part of the overall housing need of the district that we have to plan for. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So if there's no more non-committee members wishing to speak, we'll move it into the committee and Councillor Allen, you're up first. I thought we might have gone a whole meeting without doing it. You're muted, Mike. Thank you. I um, remember the inception of this report because I commissioned it 
in 2019. And the aim of it was to actually look at each life stage and see what people wanted. And uh, unfortunately, the analysis produced doesn't help um, fully identify that. And I'm sure that, um, for example, there are questions in there such as question two and question five of the um, uh, questionnaire that was sent out, which could be analysed by age uh, or by type of um, tenure or a number of different ways which haven't been done and would be useful to see because the original concept was we ought to be designing and building homes for the people who are wanting to live in them and the report doesn't really meet the objective. The second thing is that if we look at um, Ed Freeman's report and 2.2 D, as Sir Paul Miller has pointed out, there are 461 affordable homes recommended per annum. If you look at point F, there are 320 sheltered and extra care homes recommended per annum. That totals 781 and the report recommends a total need of between 900 and 918 homes. So I'm hopeful that uh, Ed Freeman can tell me if I've interpreted that incorrectly uh, and why only 119 homes are being built for residents and others uh, who don't fall into those first two categories. I, I know that's not going to be the case so I'm just a bit confused in amongst all the statistics as to whether the interpretation coming out of the statistics in Ed Freeman's report is accurate. Thank you Chairman. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I'll let Ed answer for himself on that. Um, well, I, I believe the figures are, are accurate. Um, I think the point that's being highlighted is that our affordable housing need always outstrips what we can feasibly deliver uh, fundamentally, and that is a, a fundamental problem that we will need to tackle through preparation of the local plan. Um, but obviously, we rely on um, the proportion that our policies require developers to deliver of affordable housing and that obviously has to reflect what is viable for those developments to deliver um, and so inevitably it's um, very challenging if not impossible to deliver to the affordable housing needs that have actually been identified um, but clearly that's a challenge we will have to try and address through the local plan process I wasn't uh, necessarily envisaging getting into discussion about what the solutions are to the problems that um, this report highlights today. Uh, clearly we have a local plan process that's in the planning for the next uh, sort of three years to debate and discuss these issues and come up with solutions to them but uh, Councillor Allen is right it does highlight a fundamental problem in that our affordable housing needs um, you know make up a massive proportion of our overall needs um, and, and therefore we need to somehow tackle that through through our policies and, and local plan process moving forward. Yes, all I'm asking Ed is that um, we perhaps can have an explanation of the data because clearly I think something must have been, gone wrong in translation. Uh, there can't be only 119 homes for everybody else in amongst your uh, forward, forward forecast. So if we go back to the original document and the analysis there, mm -hmm. I think that it doesn't actually say what your report to us says and please could you clarify that for the next meeting okay councillor uh, skinner uh, <clears throat> thank you mr chairman and i'm i'm going to do something fairly unusual for me and i'm going to actually agree very much with what Councillor Marion Rickson uh, was was talking about. She's made an awful lot of sense. And I'm sure there's many people 
uh, and councillors and, and, and people as well, that if all that we're going to do is to build houses and more employment land and more houses and more employment land and more houses and more employment land, and there's nothing in it for us, we just as well build none, and then we could move forward on, on that basis because we live in a lovely place. The fact that we live in a lovely place is why people want to move here. And as, as Ed Freeman quite rightly pointed out, um, the actual having a percent, percentage in there for people to migrate into the into East Devon is something that we've been uh, achieving over many, many years because of the actual natural environment, possibly the natural environment, low crime rate, high education or good education that we have and, and just the way that we live in this part of the world. So I, I take really on, on board, so I do agree with Councillor Wicks, and the, the only thing is we, we do have democracy and people do have the freedom to be able to live wherever they want. And I'm sure that if we actually had a show of hands about all the councillors in East Devon, how many were actually born in East Devon, I don't expect it would probably be too many. I wouldn't know, but uh, well, not that I need to go down that road. Um, but it is, it is something that we do live in a wonderful place. I think what I want to do, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is to actually move the recommendation, if I may. Ed is going to come back with discussing about whether or not uh, uh, the figures, we can debate the accuracy of those figures, and quite rightly, did Councillor uh, Mike Allen um, pull that out if there was discrepancies anywhere? And I'm sure nothing is done intentionally. Those things can come out. But for the sake of moving on, I'm moving on for your agenda. I'm quite happy to move the recommendations that are going to be, the recommendations to be noted, and see and get a second a week and move on. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much, Councillor Skinner. Councillor Howe? Yeah, I, I second Councillor Skinner's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Allen's just done it anyway. Fantastic. So if we just take that to a vote, Shirley, over to you. Thank you, members. This one's a fairly straightforward one. The recommendation is that members note the content of this report and agree for it to form part of the evidence base for production of the new local plan. As usual, please, if you're in support, please press your yes button. If you're against the motion, press your no button. And if you wish to abstain, raise your blue hand. Okay, for the benefit of those watching us online, the vote is now currently taking place. Uh, Chairman, that motion is carried and there is one abstention. Thank you very much. Chair, uh, yes. through, through you, can I just uh, uh, add a little comment for Mr. Freeman? I know this is only a draft report, but on um, figure 46 of that, um, of the report, um, the key is identical for two separate graphs. In case it was missed when it went through its final checking process, uh, both of them refer to uh, private rent uh, with no housing benefit, but I believe that one of them should be with housing benefit. Just a tiny slight typo, but I wouldn't want it to end up in the final report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hayward. So if we move on to agenda item 10, the housing monitoring update. Uh, to year end, 31st of March 2020. Again, over to you, Ed Freeman. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I, I'll just say I'll, I'll look into the, the point that Council Hayward uh, raised before we finalise the report. Um, turning, turning to agenda item 10, uh, so hopefully members will be familiar with these annual monitoring reports on housing, of which this is the latest covering the monitoring period up to the year ending 31st of March. Uh, the data shows that 1,065 homes were completed in the year uh, to the end of March, demonstrating a marked increase over the previous year, which was at 929. Um, in fact, I believe this is the highest number we've ever delivered in a single year in East Devon, certainly since records began. Um, future supply is forecast in the table at paragraph 2.4 in the report and you'll see that this includes the Cranbrook expansion areas and accident serve and extension uh, starting to deliver new homes in the next few years um, these are obviously all subject to applications but rely on the Cranbrook plan and accidents to master plan being progressed um, and so there are challenges to be overcome in terms of those uh, sites delivering to the current uh, projection um, our current five-year land supply position is, I'm pleased to report, 5.73 years. So we do still have a five-year housing land supply. Um, it is, however, a declining position. Uh, I think we were over six years a year ago. Um, and obviously, as I said, it depends on a number of key sites coming forward 
uh, to schedule in the coming years. Uh, there's also a significant risk that members need to be aware of. Uh, it's probably fairly obvious, but obviously COVID-19 uh, has led to delivery slowing down on a number of sites. Um, and so there will be implications for us and indeed all planning authorities in terms of a slowed rate of delivery uh, likely over this current year um, due to those restrictions and no doubt ongoing in terms of the economic impact of the pandemic. Um, however, we've taken the view that this is currently unquantifiable and so haven't taken uh, a detailed account of this um, really in terms of, of the work on this, which is obviously mainly looking back over delivery and, and forecasting the future, which is, is very hard to do uh, in terms of the current situation. Um, so we have done a, some initial work, however, just looking at um, the potential impacts, which is summarised in paragraph 6.1, and you'll see that there is some leeway in, in the figures in terms of delays. But I think um, delays in terms of delivery for more than sort of six months um, starts to potentially cause some issues. Um, so for the moment, members are, are simply asked to note the completion data and future projections as included in the report and confirmation of the five-year land supply position. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, if we look outside of the committee first, does anyone wish to speak on this agenda item? No, so we move into the committee. Councillor Allen. Simply moving approval of the uh, recommendation as it stands, Chair. Second that, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. Does anyone else wish to speak or can we move to a vote? Let's move to a vote. Shelley, after you. <laughs> Thank you, members. It's straightforward that the committee notes the residential dwellings completion data and future projections for the district. And secondly, that the committee notes the confirmation of a five year land supply, but also that the five year land supply figure has dropped since the last report. Please press yes button if you're in support of motion, no button if you're against motion and raise your blue hand if you wish to abstain. So for the benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place and that is carried, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. So quickly moving on to agenda item 11, uh, the employment land review. Uh, over to you, Ed, again. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So uh, this one, uh, like the previous report, is an annual report considering the delivery of employment sites in the district this time. Uh, unlike with housing, we are not monitored by government and required to have a five year land supply, but it is nevertheless important to maintain supply and reflect the aspirations in the local plan of delivering jobs alongside housing. Um, unlike housing, the delivery of employment sites is less consistent um, where you know, a single major site delivered in a year can significantly boost supply, whereas housing has always been much more consistent in terms of the numbers delivered e over each year. Um, in the year, we've granted consent for 5.56 hectares of additional employment land, bringing a total of 42.86 hectares of consented employment land in the system. Um, 23.5 hectares of employment land has been delivered with the Amazon Fulfillment Centre, which has obviously been the major um, employment site delivered in, in, over this monitoring period and obviously has had a significant impact on the overall provision in, in the district in that time frame. Um, the attached appendix to the report obviously goes through each individual sites identifying the current position, so I won't go through all of that in detail. Um, we have obviously in recent times sought to report on employment numbers in the district as part of these reports um, so that we could um, give you some indication at least of the number of jobs versus the number of homes. Uh, however, the published data on this has not been updated since 2018 and still shows 48,000 employee jobs in the district. Uh, we've been in touch with NOMIS that produced that data and we understand that it is in the process of being updated but is not available unfortunately for this report. Um, so aside from that, uh, members are asked to, to note the report. Thank you. Mr Chairman, may I speak first please? It's not convention, Councillor Skinner. You have to wait until the, we speak to yes. members outside of the committee and then it comes back in. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you why because but the reason is, as I said to you, I'm not declaring an interest. Actually, if you look at 3.4 of completions, they use the word Greendale Business Park, and they also use the wording of Hogsport Units. And on that basis, 
It says the Carter family are friends of mine. I need to declare an interest in that. Although the report is not going to specifically talk about sites, but I want to make sure that I'm actually declaring an interest in this particular subject. So I don't intend to get involved in any of the debate or get involved in any voting uh, on this particular report. And I would just wonder, Shirley, if she is there, did I ought to declare this and, and leave the meeting at this point as no decisions and discussion has taken place? Um, what kind of interest are you declaring, um, Councillor Skinner? Um, if what? they are friends, is it more than just a passing acquaintance? Or is it no, no, more no. a case of um, you may be biased in, in any any dealings with the matter? Well, no, I, I, I may be biased, I suppose. One ought to say that because they're close friends of mine. So I, I need to declare on that basis. So I in, think I ought, to, I ought case, to perhaps leave the, leave the meeting. If you wish, yes, Councillor Skinner, but uh, you don't have to. But I would advise not taking part in the debate or in the vote. So if I just stay here, what you're advising is that I just don't get involved in any of it because it is only yes. they're not specific about the sites per se. I'm just making my point, no. my position absolutely clear to everybody. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Skinner. So if we start outside of the committee, does anyone wish to speak on this? No, so moving into the committee, does anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Howe? Thank you. It, it, I suppose really it's just a, a, a subtle reminder before I propose moving it. Um, our current local plan has a, to me, stupid ambition of one house, one job. Um, it's never been achieved, never will be achieved, and is not the reality of the current climate we work in, particularly with the number of um, retired people in our district. Um, and obviously, even more so now, we've got people working from home, COVID situation, and all the rest of it. The world doesn't work with one house, one job anymore. So I suppose the new local plan really should adjust that with a more realistic figure. But otherwise, the report is what it is. Um, and I'm happy to recommend approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Howard. Does anyone wish to second that? I'll second that. Thank you, Dan. Councillor McLaughlin. So, Councillor Allen. Uh, just to clarify, for Mike Howe's sake, uh, the trend prior to the inception of the current local plan was that there was in fact one job for every new home added to the uh, total. Now, it wasn't a stupid thing to aspire to continue that particular thing. And obviously, if you look forward, it's very difficult to predict what will be the case. But if we don't have people who have jobs occupying homes, then the implication is either they are disabled and live off the state or they are otherwise unemployed or they are retired. So I have no objection to a rigorous review of the forward numbers for employment, but it's vitally important that we don't give uh, any kind of credence to standing back from the need for reviewing the employment space we need in the new local plan. And I was going to ask Ed Freeman how much of the local plan hectareage has actually been identified for development. It's clear to me that we need a wholesale new look at the employment needs uh, in terms of accommodation, building space and style of housing if there's going to be a lot of working from home. And I think that it's about time that we really rigorously looked into future needs. But unfortunately, we're right at the beginning of a real step change in the, our environment. And I'm hoping that as we go through the local plan review, that we will be able to come up with some really good um, aspirations and 
solid evidence as to what type of housing, including the disabled housing that I've always been very keen on, and including the uh, working from homes environment and the small business needs for the forthcoming decades. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. So if no one else wishes to speak, no, so we'll take that to a vote again, shall we? Members, this is a straightforward um, acknowledgement of this report. If you wish to acknowledge it, please press yes. If you do not, please press no, or, or if you wish to abstain, please raise your blue hand. For the benefit of those watching online, the vote's now taking place. And that is carried, Chairman, with one abstention. Thanks very much, Debbie. Uh, if we move on to agenda item 13, section 106, and SIL developers' contributions, like a chuckle brother saying to me to you, over to you again, Ed Freeman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so this is another annual monitoring report like the previous two, um, this time considering the monies received and spent through Section 106 receipts and SIL. Uh, in terms of Section 106 agreements, we've received just over £850,000 in the reporting year and the pie chart on page six of the report shows you a breakdown of what those monies relate to, um, showing a broad spread of infrastructure types covered by those agreements. Over the same period, there's been spend of just over £550,000, uh, with the largest area of spend being habitat mitigation and sport and play projects. And we've given an example of one of those play projects at Knoll Village Hall uh, in the report where a successful project was completed this year using 106 monies. Um, in terms of SIL, we've collected just over £3.2 million in the financial year, with a further 22 thousand uh, pounds due to be paid um, so this is where um, an invoice has been sent and as part of the uh, regular amount that's um, actually uh, due to be paid and there's over two million pounds in potential receipts where we've granted consent for development um, and uh, obviously waiting for that to come forward before um, seeking those um, payments uh, so from this sill pot, we have to pay neighbourhood proportions, and these are detailed in Table 3 of the report, so you can see which uh, community has benefited from and is coming through uh, the sill process in this year. Although the spend of the neighbourhood proportion is obviously down to the respective communities, the spend of the remainder is for members to decide, and so it is proposed that the sill member working party meet to discuss spend options for this year. Uh, members are also asked to note the work has been ongoing to transfer data onto our XCOM system, which has admittedly been going on for some time, uh, having proved far more time consuming and complicated than we originally envisaged. However, we are nearly there um, and then we hope to be able to put the data online through a public interface module, which would go onto our website. Um, and table six and seven in the report give you some screenshots of the data held and um, how, that, how that can be displayed. Um, much of this data now needs to go into an annual infrastructure funding statement that under new government guidance we are required to produce and publish by the end of the year. Uh, members are asked to note this requirement and the data in the report and agree to convene a meeting of the civil member working party. Thank you and over to you Chairman. Thanks very much. Uh, again, non-committee uh, non members that wish to speak, Councillor Rowland. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I ask Ed exactly what the problem is about uploading the system? Because I can recall at a scrutiny committee meeting being given a commitment that the work was almost complete back in January. Now, I realise we've had the COVID situation, obviously, which has had an impact, but I'm just wondering between January and March, how much work there was to complete and what actually prevented that at the time? That's my first question. My second question relates to how much um, is due, that has been due for some time, which hasn't yet been paid, and what action is being taken to recover that money? 
Thank you. Thanks very much, Jack. Um, if no other outside members wish to speak, I think we'll just quickly go to Ed Freeman and then we'll go into the committee. Um, thank you, Simon. So um, in, in terms of XCOM, um, yes, we were in a position where uh, it should have been up to date by the end of the first quarter of this year. Obviously, we did have COVID-19 and the officer that was undertaking that work was seconded into the community hub, um, which was considered obviously to be the priority at the time. Um, and so she wasn't able to complete that task to the original time scale. She has fairly recently um, obviously um, with the winding up of the community hub and that work being passed to the CSC, uh, reverted back to her normal role um, and is now working hard to get that information up to date. However, obviously in the meantime, it, it became more out of date, if you see what I mean, because we had the last six months of, of data not being put on the system as well. Um, but uh, we are making significant progress at um, getting that back up to date and I hope that we'll be able to put the public facing module online shortly. Um, with regard to the monies overdue, I don't have that information to hand that's not part of, of the monitoring report. Um, but as a, well, hopefully as you'll understand from what I've just said, obviously we are behind on that area of work as well. Um, and obviously we're trying to catch ourselves up as quickly as possible. There is work ongoing. Um, indeed, there's an audit being, being done at the moment in terms of some of these issues uh, so that we have um, up-to-date data on these issues and, and can take a view on what needs to be done to try and um, resolve uh, any issues that come out of that audit. But obviously the data is not 100% up-to-date and there is obviously a piece of work that needs to be done to resolve that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if we bring it into the committee, does any committee member wish to speak? Councillor Arnold. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, just Ed, I, can you just um, confirm for me? I, I think um, we've commissioned a piece of work, haven't we, from the South West Audit Partnership, looking into S106 and SIL. Uh, and I believe that that report is ready to come in very soon. Is that correct? Yes, I, I believe it's currently being drafted. I haven't seen a draft yet, but it is due shortly, yes. And Chair, through you, Chair, can I just ask, is that report to come to this committee or to Cabinet or where, where's its ultimate destination? I believe those reports go to Audit and Governance Committee. Okay. Yeah, Chair, I'm just thinking um, that's sort of germane to us as well, isn't it, really? Um, that, that's a worry for me, Chair, that we've, with the recommendation as it is, and I, and I, and I see what it is, um, we're sort of accepting a report, so to speak, aren't we? We're noting the contents of a report, but we're, we're short of a document that's maybe a couple of weeks away. Um, I'm not sure what to do about that. I'm just, just putting that down as a as a thing. I mean, as I understand it, the Southwest Audit Partnership are, you know, doing a really uh, thorough uh, and historical analysis uh, of past practice and where we are today, including some of the challenges that Ed has identified. Um, and I can't help feeling we should talk about that as well. So, Chair, if it would help, it's Mark here. Go ahead, Mark. Um, so Ed is right that the, the normal process is that the, the reports go through to the Audit and Governance Committee to be considered because they get a, a regular update on all the audits that are done uh, within the authority. But I think where there's something relevant um, to a particular committee, of which this one, this particular audit that's referred to would be, then I would expect it to also come to this committee uh, when, it's, um, when it's been issued uh, and, a, and a report can be prepared. So whether you want to just literally note the contents of this report, because it is in fundamentally just the annual statement that we're required to do, but we can assure you that we can bring the, um, the SWAT report to this committee in due course. Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Paul, are you happy with that? Thank you, Chair, very much so. Thank you. Thank you. So, Councillor Mike Howe. 
Yeah, I'm just going to move the recommendation in line with what uh, our CEO has just said. Um, I would like just to make two quick points. I believe I'm on the SIL members working party. I could be wrong, but never, nevertheless, I ought to declare that. Um, and secondly, obviously, just to give some uh, reassurance, even if someone hasn't paid SIL, that SIL bill remains on the land. So they can't get away from it. They go bust. The next person picks that land up, still has to pay SIL. So it's not that we will ever lose out. Um, and I will never say with perfect, you know, chasing things and everything else. But at the same time, that money is secured. It's just when we get our hands on it. So, you know, I'm happy to move. Thank you. Thanks very much. Would someone like to second that? Councillor Davey. So if, yes, I will. Chair. Thank you very much. If no one else wishes to speak, we'll move again to Shirley. Thank you, Chair. Therefore, you have three recommendations here. The note the contents of the report, note the requirement to provide an annual infrastructure funding statement, and thirdly, convene a meeting of the SIL members working party to consider options for the spend of SIL receipts and form recommendations for future consideration by strategic planning committee. If again, you, if you are approve this motion, please press yes button. If you're against the recommendation, press the no button. And if you wish to abstain, raise your blue hand. So for the benefit of those watching us online, the vote is now taking place. And that appears to be carried. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. We move on to agenda item 14, affordable supplement uh, supplementary planning document and mortgage exemption clauses. Again, Ed, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, members will recall that I have brought various iterations, I think, of this affordable housing supplementary planning document to the committee over the last year or so while we've been consulting, uh, considering those responses and amending the document, uh, etc. Uh, I'm pleased to say that following consultation at the start of this year on the latest draft uh, and some minor amendments to the document to reflect the comments received, we are now in a position to recommend that members adopt the SPD as appended to this report. Uh, on a related matter, members are also asked to consider amendments to the process for considering Section 106 agreements in relation to affordable housing, uh, known as mortgagee exemption clauses. So a number of our old Section 106 agreements include technical wording that is no longer used and affects the amount of funds a registered provider can borrow against in relation to the properties uh, provided under that agreement. Uh, and therefore, this affects the funding that's available to them to then deliver future affordable housing schemes. Uh, the current process means that officers have to prepare a report which is then sent to the ward members for their agreement before being signed off by the development manager, either himself or in consultation with the chair of planning committee. Uh, this is quite a time consuming process um, and is considered by officers to be unnecessary for what is a technical change to wording an agreement to simply bring them in line with standard clauses used in new agreements today and indeed across the sector. Uh, it's therefore recommended that the powers to make these changes be entirely delegated to officers. If members are in agreement, this would need to form a recommendation to council to enable the necessary changes to the constitution. Uh, similarly, the powers to adopt the SPD lie with cabinet, uh, and so we are simply seeking a recommendation from members today for the adoption of the SPD uh, as a recommendation to cabinet. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed. So, does any member outside of the committee wish to speak? No. So, we'll move into the committee. Councillor Mike Howe, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr Chair. Um, I, I'm happy to move this, although I'm not totally happy with item three. I firmly believe that we ought to still have some oversight of this, and to keep it all so simple at the same time, I believe the delegation shouldn't be given to the service lead, it should be given to the chairman of planning. Um, Councillor Eileen Rag currently, she meets weekly, the planning, that planning 
has delegation every week, so I don't see it would be a time frame issue or anything else. But at least then a councillor, councillors have, because the vice chair is goes to that meeting as well, has a constant overview of that sort of thing. So I just wanted that halfway house and I propose amending item three to giving it to the template clause to make sure it goes to uh, chairman's delegation of planning. Um, with that, I'd like to move the recommendation if anyone would second me. So chair, could I just make a comment? I'm seconding Mike Howe's proposal. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Mark, go ahead. Uh, just from a purely technical thing, it be to the service lead, but in consultation with the chairman of um, the planning committee, so that uh, uh, that, that will tie in then with the other consultation, um, sorry, the other delegations as they apply in relation to decisions. Fantastic. Mike, you happy with that? I'm more than happy with that. He knew I knew he would come up with the correct wording for me, sir. So thank you very much, Chair. <laughs> yeah, agree. Thank you. Mike Allen, do you want to come back and say anything, or is that an old blue hand? Oh, I, I just said I agreed. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much. Councillor Davey. Yeah, quick question for Ed. Interesting, we were talking about consultation earlier in the context of the local plan. And I notice that um, uh, in point four, uh, you talk about the, the responses that, that were kind of asked for um, and uh, all parish councils, numerous planning agents, registered providers, and around 2,300 individuals expressed an interest and a total of 22 responses were received. So my question is how typical uh, do you think those responses were and are they a suitable basis for us then to go on to make policy? So through you Chairman, I, I, I think in this case you're right, the, the response rate is, is very low but I think we have to bear in mind that we had consulted I think on two previous occasions on this document um, so I take that as a reflection that it's accepted that we have listened to the uh, responses that were received to previous rounds of consultation and adequately responded to them that the vast majority of people are now happy with this. Um, so I think it's a reflection of the good consultation and engagement we've done in, in the past um, that's led to that. Um, it's also probably worth bearing in mind that the um, so a couple of thousand people are people that have registered generally for interest in planning policy issues in East Devon. They may not necessarily have been interested in affordable housing issues. So um, it was a bit of a carpet bomb approach, as it were, but it is perhaps inevitable that um, a, a large proportion of them may never have been interested in this particular subject, but they're people we've committed to engage with on planning policy issues. Hopefully that helps. Thank you, Ed. That's great. So if no one else wishes to speak, can we please take a, a vote on Councillor Howe's proposal? Thank you, Chair. The, rec the motion is to note the comments received during the second round of public consultation on the draft affordable housing supplementary planning document and endorse the Council's response. Element two, to consider and recommend to Cabinet that the affordable housing supplementary planning document attached as appendix A to the report is adopted. And thirdly, to recommend to council that the constitution be amended to add deeds of variation to amend mortgage exemption clauses in line with the securitization working group template clause to the list of other planning delegations to the service lead planning strategy and development management in consultation with the chair of planning committee if you support the motions please press your yes button if you're against the motion please press your no button and if you wish to abstain please raise your blue hand thank you for the benefit of those watching online the vote is now taking place and that is carried chair with one abstention thank you just for that, Mike, you you seconded that motion, but then you abstained from the vote. Good spot. 
I think that is a, a full vote for yes now, Chair. Thank you. Good spot. Thanks very much. So if we move on to agenda item 15, the Heritage Strategy Monitoring Report and East Budley Conservation Area Review. Ed, over to you again. We're making a, <laughs> we're making a thing of this. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so this is uh, yet another annual monitoring report. Um, this time it's the first one documenting progress on implementing our heritage strategy that members adopted last year. Uh, members will recall the strategy set out a 12 year action plan with both short term tasks for delivery during the 19 uh, to 2020 year and then medium and long term targets for subsequent periods. Um, I'm pleased to report that 17 of the 18 short-term actions for the 1920 year have been achieved uh, and two of the medium-term actions have also been achieved. Um, these include provision of a guide to the listing of local heritage assets as well as process for supporting communities in undertaking conservation area appraisals and listing local heritage assets. Uh, this has been realised through a pilot scheme at East Budley, where a review of the conservation area has been undertaken by the community with the support of officers and Historic England. Uh, a new conservation area appraisal document has been produced and a number of local heritage assets identified. Uh, members are asked to note the Heritage Strategy Monitoring Report and adopt the revised East Budley Conservation Area Appraisal Review and Management Plan, which is appended to the report. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So, non-committee members, does anyone wish to speak? No, so we'll move into the committee. Councillor Ian Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Now, just, just a very quick point here. I've been through the monitoring reports and the looked at the Budley situation. Now, it may just be my reading of it, but there seems to be one glaring omission from the engagement uh, relating to the, to the project. There's no mention anywhere of owners in the report, in its production, in its in, it refers to communities, but it never refers to owners. For example, of, of the properties that are, you know, intended to be part of the, of the of a conservation zone or of a heritage policy. I just wondered whether that was intentional or whether, you know, in an attempt really to be a little bit more successful than Boris's with Andy Burnham, that we actually look to engage directly with the with the people who, who own the properties, explicitly. Thanks very much for that. Ed, can you shed any light? Yes, certainly just to say, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so where a conservation area is extended, uh, obviously there is consultation and there's a whole process we have to go through under the legislation to extend the conservation area because obviously the owners of properties are then put within the conservation area and need to have an opportunity to comment on, on that. Um, that isn't the case in the case of East Budley. Um, I don't think the boundaries of the conservation area have changed, simply that um, it's a new document documenting the significance of the conservation area and the new action plan uh, for, for um, maintaining the heritage within the conservation area. There were, however, a, a small number of properties that were added onto the local list through the work at East Budley. And as part of that process, we did engage with the owners of those properties and give them an opportunity to comment on, on that before any final decision was, was made to put them on the local list. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed. Uh, so if no one else wishes to speak, I'm happy to move the recommendations and propose them from the chair. So if we can take that to a vote. Thank you, Chair. Therefore, the motions to are that members note the Heritage Strategy Monitoring Report and secondly that members approve the East Budley Conservation Area Appraisal Review and Management Plan 2020 for adoption. If you are in support of the motion please press your yes button, if you're against the motion please press your no button and if you wish to abstain please raise your blue hand. Thank you. For the benefit of those watching online the vote is now taking place. And that is carried. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. So the last agenda item. So agenda item 16, Cliffs Valley Regional Park Master Plan. For the final time today, Ed, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
Um, so members will be aware that the local plan identifies the Clist Valley Regional Park and envisages it forming a large multifunctional regional park providing a network of natural spaces accessed by footpaths and cycleways. Uh, work has been ongoing to deliver the regional park and some members will recall an initial delivery plan for the Clist Valley Trail which will form the backbone of the regional park uh, was considered by this committee in February in 2018. Uh, a need for an off-road alignment of this route means that um, that's currently being revised. However, alongside that work, we've been producing a draft master plan for the regional park. Um, this has been developed through a task and finish group, which includes all three levels of local government within the area, as well as partners such as the Environment Agency, Natural England, Sustrans and others. Uh, there's been a range of engagement activities during that work, which is summarised in paragraph 2.2 .2 of the report. Um, so we've really sought to engage people through the preparation of the work. And now a draft has been produced and it's proposed to consult on this in accordance with the requirements of the adopted statement of community involvement for planning documents. So members are asked to agree for this consultation to go ahead with the results of the consultation and a revised master plan to be presented to a future meeting of the committee. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed. So non-committee members will go to you first. So Councillor Jeppe Young. Thank you, Chair. A green policy uh, to be proud of. Um, the Cliss Valley Regional Park was included in the local plan that became live in 2016, Strategy 10, if you want to have a look at that. Uh, much work has uh, taken place since then and this consultation uh, proposes an expansion to the development of this exciting delivery of many green initiatives, which is um, equally needed by East Devon and Exeter uh, for their green lungs. Uh, please support this consultation and encourage your residents to take part in this consultation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeff. So if no other Non-committee members wish to speak. We'll move it into the committee. And Councillor Howell, you're up first. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm happy for this to go to consultation, but I request a couple of amendments, um, particularly on the consultation document on page 33. Figure, what the hell is the figure? It hasn't got a figure. Oh, figure 26, a plan of potential projects. Um, I have a nagging doubt as much as i want this to succeed and it's got to succeed i cannot understand how we have habitat corridors not covered by the area project there are such habitats in between because it's supposed to be continuous so we should join the lines up quite literally and the area project should encompass all habitat corridors so i request that we fill in those blanks and cover that. I have a second suggestion as well, and um, it relates to my own ward in Clist St Mary, where there is a footpath approved from Winslade Park to Clist St George. Correction, cycle path approved, planning permission, um, from Winslade Park to Clist St George. The residents of Clist St George and Ebford particularly want it because it would get them across the Woodbury Road, which is a nightmare to cross, stopping pedestrians. Um, and it has planning permission, but it is not included in this public consultation draft um, because at present Devon Highways are objecting to it. Surely that's the whole point of consultation is to ask people what they finally think so that we as councillors and officers, including Devon County officers, can then put those conclusions from the public back to themselves and ask their questions as to are we doing the right thing or are we just blindly going along with some policy made up somewhere else? So I do ask that those two amendments be made, but the consultation nevertheless should go out. Um, over to the rest of you. Thank you, Councillor Howe. Does anyone wish to second that? Yes, I will, Chair. I had my hand up to do that, so happy to do so. Thank you, Councillor Arna. So, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say that uh, this was a fundamental approach to the development of Cranbrook and to ensure that there were wildlife 
channels as well as human appreciation for this whole area so that uh, there are really significant ecological and, and uh, uh, re um, leisure benefits to this particular development. I'm, I am very proud that we have put this in. I'm not happy that parts of it were nibbled away. So I would like to know from uh, Mr Freeman how we can absolutely guarantee that no further development will take place in these areas. Will the master plan achieve that or is there anything else we need to do? Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Ed, do you want to just quickly pick that up before we take it to a vote? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd have to look into the individual circumstances. Obviously, um, there's policies within the local plan about um, not allowing development that would restrict um, the delivery of the Cliffs Valley Regional Park and um, impact on it. But obviously, it's one of many material planning considerations. So um, if in one or two cases that's been outweighed by other issues, I'd need to look into those and understand exactly uh, what's happened, I can't remember off the top of my head um, at this time of night, to be honest, um, but happy to uh, to look into that. Um, but obviously, um, the aspiration to deliver the Kiss Valley Regional Park has to carry significant weight um, in the decision-making process, so there must have been good reasons if we've gone against that policy consideration. Um, while I'm speaking, can I just ask Mike how if he could clarify particularly his first point? I, I, I wasn't quick enough on <laughs> on the uptake of um, the, the page reference he was referring to and what the change he was asking for was. Sorry. That's fine, Mr. Freeman. Thank you very much. Page 33, obviously, the map there, which is figure 26 in particular, but it does encompass much wider area. When you follow the um, area project down in blue, Chris Hunnerton has a uh, habitat corridor that crosses across the A30, um, but there is a gap for the area project. Now, we shouldn't have any gaps in the area project for a start, it should be continuous, um, but of course the habitat corridor also then needs to be part of it. That is an obvious one. There is another one well, there's actually several that I believe should be encompassed uh, further to the east, if the map is orientated correctly, um, around Greendale area, Marsh Green, um, same with Woodbury Salterton, where there are large swathes of habitat corridor that are being totally ignored. Now, I'm not saying they should be in the final document, but I do believe we should consult with the document so that landowners and developers can come back and say no they don't want this to happen for whatever reason but at present we're not challenging those developers and those landowners we're just putting out a fairly carte blanche we're safe with this almost opinion and i don't believe that should ever be where we try to achieve our um consultations they should be trying to press the subject so we get full facts back so there are many uh, habitat corridors that I believe should be covered by the area project blue and I wish that to be seen as part of the consultation. If I may okay. chairman if I could just come back and I'm just concerned that we are redesigning the consultation document and perhaps some of these issues would be better um, brought forward by Councillor Howe and any of the members of the Council uh, as a response to the consultation um, rather than trying to redraft the document as we are going along to that tonight. Thank you very much uh, Mr Shaw. I, I understand your comments. The outcome would have to be then a second re-consultation which I don't believe is the correct way to go. Um, I believe we should consultate, consult on the first time of what we're trying to achieve. Whereas what you're saying is we get all the comments back, we put the extra blue bits in, and then we consult a second time for the landowners now affected. Surely we should do it the other way around. And I don't believe it would take much after speaking to 
um, Mr. Bates, who's obviously the author of this. Thanks, Mike. So, oh, Councillor Faithful, I know we shouldn't do it, but he's sat here the whole meeting. Um, so, Councillor Faithful, we'll just hear from you quickly. I just noticed that um, on the plans, the uh, there are quite a lot of footpaths which are marked out as bridleways. Is it a plan to change, upgrade footpaths into bridleways? Because some of them look quite unsuitable as bridleways. I'll give Ed a few minutes on that and we'll come back. So if we go to Councillor Paul Arnott. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to come in behind my friend Councillor Howe there, actually. I do, th I do think it's we do need to, and I've had experience of this with the local plan in Collerton. Um, if, you, if you have details that you think are not correct at this stage and you can identify them, and there's a means of identifying them through a motion and amendment such as this, I think it's really helpful. Otherwise, it just gets lost again, doesn't it? So I'm, I don't know how Mike's feeling, but I'm, I'm robustly behind your amendment, Mike, still. Um, so, Chair, could I comment on that? As always, Mark. Cool. Um, so w would it help if we look at the recommendation that we do say members agree the draft Clist Valley Regional Park Master Plan for, con for um, public consultation, but delegate to um, Ed essentially in consultation with yourself any minor changes to the document prior to its issue. And that will allow um, yourselves um, to take account of the comments, for example, that um, Councillor Howe's introduced and may, maybe just put a, a period of two weeks for that to happen type thing. Yeah. Upon that advice, Mike, are you happy with that? I, I am quite content with that. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Paul, are you happy? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. So upon that new recommendation, Shirley, could we take that to a vote, please? Thank you. Therefore, members, you are being asked that members agree the draft Cliff Valley Regional Master Plan for public consultation, but delegate to Ed Freeman and the Chair of Strategic Planning Committee amendments prior to issue for consultation. Thank you. If you wish to support that motion, please press the yes button. If you're against the motion, please press your no button. And finally, raise your blue hand if you wish to abstain. For the benefit of those watching online, the vote's now taking place. And that is carried, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, that brings our meeting to an end. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for taking part today and those watching at home as well. Uh, however, can I just remind all those present that the supporting officer will confirm when the meeting is no longer being recorded or going live. And until then, your, uh, your comments will be heard live to the public. Thank you.